Hey! Welcome to Creative Block. We're your hosts, Gene. And V. We interview people in the animation industry about their life, work, hobbies, while we do Doodle Jam. We ask people on Twitter if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. And today with us, we have Phil Renda! Wee! Wee! <laughs> Hi, Phil. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. Tell us who you are and what you do. Oh, man. Isn't that what we're going to do for an hour and a half? Just start. Just go. Just go. (laughs) Well, you're the guest, so we want to hear everything about you. Uh, So I'm Phil. You guys just said that. I I work for Netflix, and I'm currently the Director of Creative Leadership and Development, um, which I'm sure we'll dig into talking about. Yeah, I would love to know what that means. What that means. And and I'm sure, you know, the, the truth is, I think, still inventing it to be totally honest, oh, yeah. um, which is which is pretty fun. But I was a character designer in animation for a long time. I started my career on the East Coast, moved out to the West Coast, have worked on a bunch of different projects uh, in a couple different capacities. And, you know, I don't know. I think I'm just like, I, I don't know. I always am like, I just feel like a guy. <laughs> <laughs> just a guy. I'm just a guy. I'm just an animation guy. I'm a... Well, you've done you've done a shitload. And your career is interesting in many ways, but I think primarily that you had a very successful, you know, career in, in animation as a designer. And at one point, and I'd love to hear this later on, is you decided to switch to being an executive on the network side. True. And, and then that sort of carried you into a completely different thing. And we've mentioned it before on the show or, you know, like sort of this idea of like, moving away from the, the the kind of raw creative and into that space. And uh, so definitely something we'll come back to. But I I would love to hear about uh, Baby Phil and sort of what got you started and what got you interested in animation and art in general. Sure. You know, it's probably a similar story to lots of your guests. But, you know, I, I was drawing from a really young age, loved being creative. My, you know, one of my best friends... Um, James Garner, uh, he, he and I used to like tape eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper together or use that long dot matrix paper that was like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of those feed printer papers. And we would just lay them out on a table and we would draw these giant naval battle scenes and like mm-hmm. air, like dog fights. We were really into, into like military stuff. And, you know, and this is probably like first grade, second grade would do these giant, giant drawings and we would like slowly add to them. And it was almost like, almost like a game that we were playing as we were drawing together. That's really fun. And then was it like, were you guys like kind of having this like as a project that you would keep coming back to you? Like, like almost like a mural that you're working on the, over the course of several days. I you know, I, I can't, I don't know if we would ever come back to it. It was definitely like, it felt like we would always dig in and then it would always be some epic thing, but like, I don't know if we'd ever come back to it. Cause it was almost more fun to start a new one. Uh, mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, I was definitely drawing forever, and I was into comics. You know, I was born in, you know, I was born in '81, so I grew up like watching the, you know, all of the the animated shows that were really designed to sell toys. So you know, I grew up on Voltron, grew up on He Man, grew up on all that stuff as a fan, and then as I got a little bit older, it was like, you know, to me like a really exciting moment in comics, like. And it's fun now to, to see people in my age group reference, like Todd McFarlane, um, mm-hmm. who it, for lots of people is almost like a, is like a joke. He, like he and Rob Liefeld and all those guys are sort of seen as almost like a lowbrow piece of, yeah, of, yeah. of the comics industry, but super influential for me. So Absolutely. So I grew up reading Spider-Man and then kind of that, it was like, you know, I guess my... My art journey is interesting. Was I always loved comics, and I and I collected comics, and I and I collected comics and um, got into them. And then again, another one of my friends, Tommy, his older brother is a comics artist. His name's John Gebbia, and John um, has done a couple books. He's he's released a few things, and he you know he was sort of like the oldest brother in in the friend group. And, mm-hmm. you know, he listened to all the cool music. He had all the, the, the cool comic art in his walls. And and John could draw, like really draw um, when we were little. And I remember talking to John about comics. And then at some point he like just decided he didn't like comics anymore. So he just handed me a stack 
of, of books. And it was like, it wasn't that big, but there were some like, I feel like it was like Mark Silvestri run on Wolverine, you know, back mm-hmm. with the, like the, the, the brown costume stuff. Mm-hmm. I can't remember some other things, but like he gave me all the stuff and I don't know, he sort of made, made the idea of like drawing like something ex- more exciting. Cause I, it was like, I knew someone actually, I can think of a couple people like this in my life. There was, Oh man, again, this is like really young grammar, like, you know, grammar school. Mm -hmm. I could draw and myself and a couple other kids, we would draw Ninja Turtles and we used to sell them at lunch. We would sell drawings of Ninja Turtles for a dollar and we, and we got in trouble for doing that uh we, you know the, the school you know the i remember the lunch aides or didn't like that we were doing little, it but little capitalists i know right it, but you know but again like we could do this stuff and people just loved it they wanted these drawings and i and i'll never forget because i remember drawing michelangelo and i was drawing him with his nunchucks spinning and i couldn't do it right i couldn't draw a spinning nunchuck and again, one of my friends, Michael, Michael Padilla, his older brother or his cousin, it might have been his cousin, could really draw. And he would redraw my nunchucks because hmm. he could actually make them look like they were spinning and, uh, okay. and we would sell them. So it was cool like to have people in my life when I was really young that could that could really do what I was trying to do. But but they were sort of still in my peer group. That's yeah, that's really cool because it's kind of like uh, a little. It, it's like the teamwork that is very similar to like actually working in animation, right? Like you do a thing, and then like you have someone like go over your drawings to, and stuff. Yeah, and it sort of made it really. Um, I, it's it's funny because I don't think I've ever really thought about both that experience drawing Ninja Turtles and 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 John in this way. But I think you're right, V. It was like I had this really interesting experience young that was like people that could kind of pull me along right they were like carrying me right. and and able to and able to you know and it, i i didn't feel insulted right because i was amazed like when when they would adjust my drawings or or, or i'd right. see what they were doing and they would kind of help me it didn't feel so personal the artwork it didn't feel like i was not good enough it felt like right Oh, these people are helping unlock those tricks to to mm-hmm. to actually be able to do what I want to do. Yeah, a yeah. good mentor will go a That's long so way. That's so cool. Yeah, and and I don't even I don't think you know I wouldn't consider them mentors, but like, but I guess it, it was like it primed me for what uh, what a mentorship experience could sure. be. Sure. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, yeah. It's like a baby version of it, an early, a prototypical version. Yeah, and then you know I guess and then I kind of fell out of it. Like I got into I remember buying a bunch of like spawn comics and like early days of image. And then I just sort of got out of comics and, and I think I just had like a couple, like a long box that sat in my closet for a long time. And then, you know, I sort of feel like a cliche cause I'm going to, you know, at some point it must've been like eighth grade, ninth grade. Like I found, I discovered like independent filmmaking and anime, like at the same time. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, and not just as a, like I was, you know, there was some anime on TV. Like I remember I used to watch like Ronin Warriors really early yeah. in the morning. But like, you know, it was, it must have been the, it must have been like the early 90s. And Akira was re-released. Ghost in the Shell was coming out. I remember like, it, it you know, I, it was like a real short moment of time where I was like, got back into comics, was, fell in love with David Lynch films and then was watching Akira and Ghost in the Shell, like driving into Philadelphia. Man, what a what a life changing combination that could be. <laughs> right. I mean, it was. It was like it was sort of this weird thing where like I always liked art as a hobby and as a thing to do, but I was kind of a math science kid. And I think when I got mm-hmm. into anime and I guess back into comics, it was this different moment where all of a sudden it was it was more than just entertainment. Like it was something I really was interested and excited to um, to learn more about, which was rad. Oh, I'm looking at your drawings now too. This is amazing, guys. Yeah, I'm just I'm just <laughs> I'm working on like a like a a ball fill, like a Kirby fill. Amazing. Oh man. Yeah. Do you um about that moment when you you were like kind of digging more into indie films and uh, and anime and 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 back into comics, kind of. Do you remember 
what kind of clicked for you? Like what was kind of like the thing that made you feel like, wow, like this is really cool that, but more than just a distraction. Yeah, I definitely, it's, it's like, and it's also wrapped up in like who I am as a human. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. in like when I started to decide, you know, either decide who I was or discover who I was, it was like, you know, I got into music. I was in a band super young with some friends. Oh shit. Really? Wait, talk about that. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> we were, I've never heard this. Th this was like middle school, super young. Yeah. But my group of friends, you know, again, they, you know, my, my buddy Rory, he had older brothers who had mm -hmm. a drum kit and he had an awesome basement and they were listening to like, demo tapes of smashing pumpkins and like mm -hmm. we were listening to all the stuff that that we didn't really you know know about i remember you know like i was super into like primus and um mm -hmm. mr bungle and faith no more and like we kind of got into like the alternative rock scene again this mm -hmm. is like you know in early 90s and i bought a guitar or my parents bought me a guitar and we started a band and we played we played twice like publicly but we were really young and I remember that being super fun. But again, like music is so it's I, I think I don't even think it's music. I think all art, when you when you connect with it, it becomes more than just a hobby. It becomes a, a statement and a reflection on who you are. Right. It's like. Right. Mm -hmm. It's an identity thing. So mm -hmm. we were these like grunge rock kids listening to music. And then that sort of, that friend group, like, I don't know, like, we sort of, we got, we kind of broke up, the band broke up, we, you know, they, they, you know, and again, like, like, drinking and drugs and, and it became not like, you know, like, honestly, it wasn't even like drugs, it was like drinking and like smoking cigarettes became, <laughs> co became Fox. cooler than than making music and oh that classic yeah and like so i, I kind of wasn't into it and you know I, I just was like oh i don't really care about like i'm not i don't I, like you know a pack of cigarettes is less interesting to me than than getting the new you know whatever the new tool album you know like mm -hmm. i was just more interested in and i like punk phil that you're drawing gene i was not yeah, a yeah, punk yeah. but i was a grunge i had like i had like long <laughs> i had long hair and did the whole stupid thing yeah but uh but yeah i mean you know so like to to v's question about when it clicked though so like it sort of was all of a sudden i got i was like listening to my music taste kind of got a little bit more into electronic music a little more industrial again like listening to cam fdm and watching oh yeah you know a lynch film and mm -hmm. also watching ghost in the shell like they Man, all shit. felt <laughs> They all a... were very related, and 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 I sort of not only like I, it's funny because I don't want to say I saw myself, but I I um, it was something that was mine. Like all of a sudden, there was like something that I could own that really spoke to who I was and what I cared about, and it wasn't anything that was like pop pushed upon me or that I felt like I had to like, it was like a choice. So I really mm. felt like I was choosing stuff. I should also mention too, like I got into like Warhammer and like, mm. you know, like tabletop war gaming when I was young. Cause my, mm -hmm. my best friend moved to the United States from England and he brought this thing that like, you know, again, was very, very not what other kids were doing but mm -hmm. but having these kind of kind of niche hobbies also gained me a certain level of independence so my parents were awesome and they would let me they would drop me off at the train station and i could i grew up in new jersey and i would just take the mm -hmm. the train into philly when i was younger and alone with a friend or two and we would go into philly and like we'd go hang out in the comic book shop and you know buy comics or play warhammer or you know go to the record shops or go to shows and it was this really, it was just so, all of that creative stuff just helped me be me and independent of, of others. So that's kind of how it clicked me. It was this like weird thing where I was like, oh, I love all of these things. How do I, how do I do this forever? And I guess like, 
to, to, to try to bring it even a little bit more full circle was like, I had a younger sister and we had a ton of, of like Disney films on VHS and like getting back into anime made me go back and look at classic Disney films again. And all of a sudden I got interested in the, the process, right? More than just the, um, more than just the, the, the end result. I was, I was intrigued by how things are made. And I think honestly, like, you know, comics, I think is so much better at that because you, it's it's really easy to understand who did what when you're looking at a comic book. Right. Whereas in animation, it's such a team sport. But like that concept of like people are making these things mm-hmm. was um, was exciting. So I, I needed to learn how animation works. And I, you know, I'm rambling now, but I, I took an no, art class. I got to take an animation class. There was a, in South Jersey, there was this school. It might even still be there. It was called Animation Arts. It was like an after-school thing. And it was run by this guy, or was founded by this guy named Ron Kaufman. And he was a producer of a Ralph Bakshi film called Hey, Good Looking. And his mom, Miriam Kaufman, kind of ran it. And she was an awful human being. Oh, I, sh- I, sh- you know, I shouldn't say that. Maybe she wasn't awful. But no, she just, her. she wasn't like, she wasn't warm. Like, this was like this yeah. art class and she just wasn't very warm. She'd just kind of sit in the office. And really, this school was a, just a kind of a one-room office in like a in like a commercial office building in, I think it was in like Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And um, and I would go there. My mom would drop me off. And I would, and it was like an hour, hour and a half long. And, and we'd sit there and you had a light box and there was a pencil test machine and there was a bunch of, there were some other kids, there were some adults there. How old were you? I, I mean, I couldn't drive, so I must have been like 15 when I started right. animating. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah, wow. and I would draw, you know, I did a bouncing ball, I did some walk cycles, and then, you know, I would, I would, you know, th- like, there's like these characters called Space Marines that are in Warhammer, and I remember like yeah. animating Space Marines. And, like, oh, so this is 40K, <laughs> this isn't like yes, this is 40 classic K. fantasy. Okay, that's the good shit, I love 40K. I'm into the sci-fi <laughs> side of this stuff, and yeah, and it's actually fun, because it, that stuff has kind of come back into my life. I sort of I sort of dropped it for a long time, and at the start of COVID, I got back into it. But uh, I was going to ask, actually. Yeah, I was going to ask if it's if it's like reemerged. I feel like everyone's been digging up all these like old hobbies. Yeah, it has reemerged. Once you mentioned it, I was like, I, I'm sure that that probably emerged in your life, reemerged. Yes, it definitely did. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, like again, so making these little pencil tests and going to this place after school, you know, once a week, like Thursday nights for a couple hours um, was great. And the guy who taught it was this guy named Brooks Statler. And he was like an experimental animation graduate from CalArts. And he was the first person who ever mentioned CalArts to me. He was the first person who Mm -hmm. ever talked about like the illusion of life and and kind of how these things get made. He worked for like the local news station doing like on-air graphics. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he was at school around the same time as Peter Chung. And I just thought that was like the coolest oh, wow. thing ever yeah. that like he was, you know, that, that he and Peter Chung were at CalArts around the same time. Um, and Brooke was just super nice, you know, and uh, and just a good guy and 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 encouraged me to do stuff. But actually, this is an awesome story is that, well, maybe I think it's an awesome story. Other people do not think it's awesome. <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. Uh, Maybe it's not awesome, but it's sort of amazing, and it really speaks to the small world that is animation. But when Brooke wasn't teaching, there would be substitute teachers. And um, one week, we went in, and the sub was a younger uh, college student. And he was working on his student film. And the drawing sort of felt a little bit like Ren and Stimpy adjacent. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I didn't have cable, so like I also like, like my, like, I was kind of a Disney afternoon kid, plus whatever Evangelion VHS would be on sale at, you know, Suncoast Video or whatever. And he was drawing this stuff that was awesome. And and his his name was Ciro. And it's it's Ciro Neely who oh, yeah. who, you know, at the time was was going to UArts. He 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 had a I think he started a small studio maybe in Philly. But like I kind of it was that also that weird moment where like the internet wasn't really a thing yet. But like, I remember kind of being able to track zero in his career mm-hmm. and, uh, and he was, you know, 
he was doing some stuff in LA and then, you know, and then, I mean, and then when I moved to LA, I met him and, and I remember running into him at Cartoon Network one time and I was like, Hey, Ciro, I don't know if you remember me. And he like, he squinted and he's like, you're that super nerdy kid from, (laughs) from New Jersey. And I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, man. And, uh, and it's just like, it was funny. I mean, I was like 16 when I met Ciro, you know, and it was like, you know, whatever it was like six years later where I'm working at Cartoon Network and, you know, and, and in LA and, you know, I don't know. It was, or maybe even longer than six years later, but yeah. small world stuff. But yeah, I remember Ciro, I stole one of his drawings and I, I actually returned, I got it, I returned it to him, but like it was pinned up in that animation school and I just grabbed it. Cause I was like, this is too good. I'm stealing this drawing. So I stole yeah. that drawing. Punk fell. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, how- how was like kind of like the transition for you between like high school and college? Because you were talking that like you moved to LA, but like what was kind of like the timeline for that? Well, you know, so high school, like I did all the art classes, like that was my thing. And um, I was, you know, I was like one of the one of the art kids and uh, I wanted to go to CalArts. Like that was the place that that I knew about. So I applied you know, my, my heart was set on going there. I thought for sure I'd be a shoe in. I had that guy, Brooke, write me a recommendation letter and I, I didn't get in. I got rejected. And, uh, and that was a huge bummer because it was like where I had my heart set on. Mm. And my second choice was, was the school of visual arts. And I got into SVA in New York. So I went to, I went to New York. So I left, I left South Jersey. Um, I grew up kind of in the New York suburbs before we moved to South Jersey. So I was, I had memories of New York City as a kid and it was super fun, you know, and like going to SVA was awesome because, and I, and I'd imagine this is the similar for you guys, but like when I got to art school, it was like, oh my God, like all of these people are like me, you know, like, and it was, the, mm-hmm. it was like, you find your tribe in this, mm-hmm. in this incredible way. So, and again, I had... I had lot. I had great friends from from high school, some of which I still keep in touch with. But we weren't bonded through creativity. You know, we were bonded through yeah. some things that we liked. But it was, it's a different kind of bond. So then, all of a sudden, I got to school, and and it, you know, I could, I met all these people, and we were in, we were interested in so much of the same stuff. So you know, f- f- freshman year at SVA was like, honestly, like you know, the best experience because I was just thrilled. And I even remember when I picked my like schedule for class, I, I was like my, my very first class in college, I want to be animation. So like, I, you know, I, that's how I picked my schedule. And, and our teacher was this guy, Eric Iser, who was like a layout guy on Beavis and Butthead and uh, was, was great. And in my freshman class, like, you know, I'm trying to think of the people who are now like doing stuff in that freshman class. Like Chris Burns was one of my classmates. He runs um, Exit 73 Studios in New York. They do some, they did that really cool short coin a few years ago. Mm. It's kind of like a pixel art film, but Chris is doing awesome stuff. And he was a classmate. This guy, Al Pardo was, was, was an amazing classmate. He could just draw amazing cartoon characters, was doing, did awesome stuff um, in New York animation um, one of my best friends is this guy Mike Oviedo, who's now in Miami doing stuff. And you know, you know, there's a there's a few a few of us from that class that sort of um, uh, Kevin Hagera, who uh, I just reconnected with recently. He was he's been up at Blue Sky for years. But I don't know. You find that group of people, and uh, and and they become your friends. But then they're also like your collaborator peers mm-hmm. forever. Sure. So it was nice. And I, you know, I don't know, like <laughs> going to college in New York city was incredible because art school was great. That freshman year was great. I'm, I don't think I was a great student to be totally honest, but like living in New York was the best because it was like, talk about that independence. Like it was, it was, it was crazy. Like to be a kid. In oh, New York, sure. In New York. Yeah. It was awesome. I can imagine. I went. I went to a tiny art school that was like ten minutes from my parents' house, and so there, were, I, like that, <laughs> that felt liberating. And so I can only imagine. It's like suddenly you're in fucking New York. That's that's crazy. That's a big jump. It was a big jump, and it was like 
I still was into anime, but but my not all of my friends were. So like my tastes changed. My the music I listened to changed because all of a sudden I was in again, I was in New York City and like some of the grunge rock I was listening to and like I got into like jam bands at one point in high school, like that didn't mean anything in New York City. So like all of a sudden I got more into hip hop and mm-hmm. some of it being like more of the like local New York kind of underground hip hop oh, stuff. That's cool. But it was it it like made more sense once I was in the city. Like the the type of stuff I lived in a pretty rural part of New Jersey and like and that stuff didn't really make any sense to me until I got to New York and then I was like, "Oh, I just I under I understood it more." So, mm-hmm. I don't know. It was cool. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like definitely there is, it's always good to have like context for art. It just kind of puts it like in a perspective that is just, uh, that makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. And like, you know, and, and my, you know, I talk about my friends in the animation department, but like, you know, in our dorms, like my friends were, you know, were, some of them were cartooning majors, some were illustration majors. I hung out with a lot of advertising and design kids. Mm. And like my influences were just so, you know, so changed and, and amazing. And again, like I, you know, I was a pretty good animator because I, I could, I got into school with a little bit of animation experience because I took those classes, but I wasn't the best draftsman. There were way better cartoonists that I had met. And again, it was one of those situations where like I was surrounded by people who were doing things that like, I wish I could do. And actually, you know, so like Tom Herpick, who, is is you know is an amazing artist tom tom was a year older than me at sva and and we i was his ra at one point and we became really close friends and like tom from the day i met him was like was a genius and a brilliant artist and and was in and you know i looked up to him then i look up to him now you know and i still Mm -hmm. you know I, i love that you know and i had this tom and myself and like James Jean was a couple of years older than us at school. Uh, Damn, there was, he went to school with James Jean. Yeah, James, I mean James was you know I think he was two years above me, and like you know you'd go into the main gallery and you'd see James's paintings and like yeah. they were incredible. You know, like mm-hmm. as a student he was doing stuff that was mind blowing. There was he had like yeah. a solo show, maybe it was his fourth year, and it was just his sketchbook drawings, and it was like it was insane. It was it was amazing yeah but but there was this drawing instructor names named james mcmullen and james uh is an illustrator he's he does a lot of the like lincoln center posters but he sort of he sort of authored this 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 life drawing approach called high focus drawing and there's a there's he published a book about it and you know tom myself james this guy corin shadme dash shaw who's an amazing yeah cartoonist dash was dash was a year younger than us he was in class with us what a crazy class. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. How do you... I guess you that's New York. It. Wow. it was New York. But, like, we all, like, became disciples of this drawing teacher. And and I joke about it a little bit, but it was a little bit like the movie Whiplash. Because he... Oh, yeah. He, like, really expected a lot of the class. And, and it was a little cultish. It was a little intense. So, mm. it's, mm-hmm. you know... My college experience was like, I liked my animation classes, but after freshman year, I sort of got less out of them in the moment. And I, and the majority of what I got, got out of that, my experience at SVA was in my life drawing classes. So I had mm-hmm. James, uh, James McMullen, Jim, we called him. So Jim was like my main teacher. And then a former student of his is this guy, Stephen Gaffney. And, um, and Gaffney... I would do like, I would draw in Jim McMullen's class from from nine a.m. until three, and then I would draw in Gaffney's class from three till six, and then sometimes from in, in his evening class as well. So sometimes I would draw for a, like a twelve-hour day, just life Jeez. drawing, and Jim wow. would be like six hours of like almost like tearing me apart and really struggling and then Mm -hmm. spending three to six hours with Steve and Gaffney to like work out frustrations and like rebuild my, my confidence in my ego. It's just a constant up and down. It was, but it was really, you know, like 
if I, if yeah. that was the part of SVA that was the best for me. So it wasn't even an animation class. I had to like sign into it. It was technically an illustration class, but that was the easily the like the in terms of the college experience of actually in classrooms. You know, that was the that was the class that I got the most out of. And it was a combination of the the the, the type of teaching and the yeah. mm-hmm. and the intensity, but then also the my classmates, you know, I mean, again, like James would come, James Jean would show up to draw and audit the class every once in a while. And he was incredible. And, and because of this cultish vibe, like, you know, even after graduation, I could go to that class. Like I could just show up and, Mm -hmm. and I would be welcome in and, and I would draw inside that classroom because you learned so much from seeing all of the other classmates work. And it was, you know, there was a lot of theory that we talked about in there too. And it was a lot about, some of it was about actual mark making and, and pencil to paper, but a lot of it was about like, who are you as an artist and what is your relationship to your art? And what is your relationship to this model that's standing in front of you? So it was really intense, but like, I think it helped to define who I was as a creative person or as an artist in in that, in that room. And I'll, I'll tell you like, it's something I miss. Like, I don't really, it it was like the most poetic creative experience that I don't think I've ever had again, you know, like outside of that classroom, you know, it it was, it was definitely something that was uh, amazing. And and it's like some dead poet society shit. (laughs) It was, it really was. It was awesome. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah, that's like one of those things that you kind of hope for, I think, going into art school is finding that, I guess, click, you know, it depends on how intense it is. Like it, can, it can drift from cult to click, like the sort of grouping of, of, uh, of people. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's great. I can't imagine. Like, that's such a that's such a crazy combination of people that like, no wonder your career has taken you so far. You, you were like just thrown into this mishmash of like creative powerhouses. I felt very lucky, you know, and I'm, you know, you're like, I'm not a shy person either, right? Like, I like to talk to people and I like to, you know, I I think that like a lot of people get really good at their creative craft by being introverts, but like, I'm an extrovert. So, Mm -hmm. so I've always liked the social aspect of, of, of working with others with, with, peers and and kind of that stuff so you know i i don't know i I really enjoy i really enjoyed that Mm -hmm. right well and your career has kind of shifted around that too because it consistently seems like you enjoy just the the people aspect of animation yeah i mean i always say like i i you know uh and this is like i always say this is like my dirty secret it's like Mm -hmm. i like i like making cartoons more than i like watching cartoons You know, like, oh, yeah, you know, and and the reason why I like making cartoons is because I love the people part of it. I love Mm -hmm. the fact that we don't do this alone. Like, for sure, it's fun, you know, to to make comics and and definitely that kind of poetic experience of 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 that intense life drawing time Mm -hmm. in my life was was amazing. But like the thing that drove me to animation was the team sport. And I love it. You know, I really did love it. So I know like I'm I'm rambling a bit, but like I'll, I'll, I'll get to sort of where where. It's like, so I, I, I was sort of a terrible student and I ended up getting a job. So I worked at a small kind of web place called uh, WDDG, World Domination Design Group. Mm-hmm. And we did, they did like Altoids.com and they did um, uh, like Lego Star Wars, the first Lego Star Wars sites and Lego Harry Potter stuff. And, mm-hmm. and I was there kind of as an in-house animator working on, on some projects and 9-11 happened. So like everything kind of changed in New York mm-hmm. City to be there for 9-11 and to be actually like, you know, again, I was in that life drawing class that Tuesday morning um, oh, wow. on September 11th. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is another just wild, wild thing. But I was working at this design place and then all of a sudden like New York changed the kind of the 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 the, the, the dot com thing kind of bottomed out, but I was cheap, right? Like I was super, super cheap art student working at this place that had some, you know, decent sized clients. 
and uh, this guy James Baker was like, let's 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 utilize you and hire a couple of your friends and and we'll do some stuff. So we we made some web cartoons for craft foods. We did we did stuff for uh, corn nuts that that snack. Um, oh yeah. So we made these corn nuts web cartoons, and then we ended up we end up making a Game Boy Advance game. So, uh, Oh wow. Yeah. So like there's a GBA game called Wade Hickston's counterpunch, which is like, like it's super problematic now. Like when you look at it, it's like, Oh boy, (laughs) Oh boy, is this problematic? But it was like, so, you know, the, again, these guys had built this thing, this web (laughs) thing called sadistic boxing. And they wanted to turn that into a GBA game. They hired myself and my buddy, Mike, to do this and Mike designed the thing and I was the kind of lead animator art director and then our buddy Andy Gonsalves who's now out here uh in LA boarding and writing he wrote the game he wrote all the like he scripted it and um and and like so I didn't make a thesis film I released a Game Boy game so yeah. like it was sort of weird like I was kind of just barely passing my classes because I was working full time and I would just kind of show progress on the work and you know I had some teachers that we're, we're, we're really trying to tell me like, what are like, why are you working? Like you should be making your own films because this is the moment for you to do it. But I just, and I don't know, I've got mixed feelings about it now, but it was important to me to work. Like I wasn't getting necessarily what I wanted out of school. I didn't feel like I was really being challenged in my animation classes. I wasn't learning about animation in the way that I had hoped I'd be learning. I also, I also tried to go to CalArts again and I got rejected a second time. And I kind of had this like FLA, fuck the LA industry. Like uh-huh. I'm gonna figure this out for myself here in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, would you say uh, this is just a kind of a random question? But would you say that this is like kind of a uh, maybe a mentality in New York to kind of have like this competition with LA a little bit? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I've heard that there's yeah weird like rivalry, and I don't I don't really get it. It's it's so funny because it is a one it is a hundred percent manufactured and one sided. Like, mm-hmm. you know, oh, yeah. in New York, there was a and it's weird because I wonder, you know, I'm a nerd, right? So like the animation industry, you know, it started on both coasts, right? Like the Fleischers right. were on the East Coast. They weren't, you know, they like, you know, the, like those cartoons were happening in New York. Windsor McKay is in New York. Mm-hmm. You know, there's all this stuff happening in in New York, and then, and then like a weird thing happened, right? Like, you got you know the Fleischer Studios moves to Florida, and for tax reasons or something, and that that like brings a lot of the industry out of New York, and then clearly you know Disney and and all of the film studios with animation units start to grow on the West Coast. But like New York was always kind of chugging along and, and and doing stuff, but just it was just a harder city to make it through. So there's this like, there's a certain like toughness to being an animation artist in New York because there's just not, it's just not where the entertainment industry is. So there's this like, you kind of toughen up. And I think part of that toughness builds this weird rivalry that like, there's something that like, you have to prove something. You know, and I'll say like when I got to when I got to L.A., when I came to L.A. just to visit to like meet some people to, you know, to 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 to, in thinking about looking for jobs, I guess. I remember like prefacing. I'd be like, yeah, I work in New York. Like, like what? Like what about it? And I just thought everyone (laughs) would be like have this weird rivalry. And people were like, oh, cool. I have a lot of friends. I've got lots of friends in New York or like, oh, yeah. And I was like, whoa, it's just a totally one sided it's just a totally one-sided uh, uh, rivalry. Very bizarre. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I've always heard that from the New York side, and I don't know anybody in LA that gives a shit. <laughs> That's like... It's true. It's weird. But I also think, yeah. like, I don't know. I think there's a little bit of fear, too, because, mm, yeah, you know, like, all of the heroes are in LA, right? Like, all of the big names were here. And in New York, like, there were some big names, but, like, you know, they would be often the indie people. Like, like, like Bill Plimpton's name would come up, mm-hmm. you know. And it was like, but Bill Plimpton wasn't, like, working side by side with you. He was a successful independent filmmaker. Right. It's almost like a, like a hometown pride thing when you're from, like, a tiny town. And it's like, yeah, we're from here, you know. And it's like, 
It's exactly obviously what it is. it's it's New York, so it's huge. But I can it's like you're saying like the the actual arena is so much smaller, and maybe there's not as many opportunities. There's way like, less opportunities, yeah. and you know, and I'll say this like as an artist in New York, there was real value in me being versatile. Like I would be designing on one show, animating on another. I would have to be able to paint backgrounds or do boards. Like I had to do everything to survive in New York because there's not that many opportunities. So you're jumping from show to show and you're having to like fill the need of whatever that, whatever that production needs or whatever that freelance job needs. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a real different environment. And I would say there's less, you know, and again, I haven't worked in New York in 15 years, so maybe this has changed, but, but like there were less specialists. There were a lot more people who were more generalists that were the ones who could survive because they could do a little bit of everything. And then on top of it, it was just a really small industry. Like, and again, I, I, like, I love New York. I miss it. I want to, I hope that the, that, that, that the New York industry can grow because it's sure. a super unique group of creative people. And I really do think environment does influence the, 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 the creativity that comes out of that environment. And like Absolutely. New York is an amazing place. So like, I want amazing animation to be coming out of New York. And so I'm like rooting for it. But when I was there, like it was a CIFA was a big deal in New York because it was mm-hmm. like the, the community was Asifa and everything was very Asifa centric. And it's because that's all New York had was a community. Whereas LA, when I moved out here, I quickly realized like, oh, Asifa was, it's not something that everyone takes part in because there's an industry here. There's more people in any one studio at any, at any moment than all of New York working in animation. You know, it was so, it just dwarfed everything. It was, it was a huge change coming from, from New York to LA, totally different environment. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I almost feel like, yeah. Cause I, I do, I, I have a lot of friends that came from New York and it seems like they all struggled. They are like, they, there's not many studios and I mean, uh, it feels like there's less and less as time goes on. Well, and, it, there's um, small, there's smaller studios and like. There weren't, you know, when I was there, there weren't too many shows that got multiple seasons. You know, I was mm-hmm. lucky. I, you know, I graduated school. I finished. I had released that game during my during my senior year, and then um, the Venture Brothers was starting, and they were testing. And I took a character design test to get on onto the Venture Brothers, and yeah. I got the job. And that was your first gig, the Venture Brothers. That's my first gig. Yeah, I mean, oh wow, that's crazy. It that was crazy, so cool. and it was the first wow. season, and. I got a test and like, and I still, and I still recommend this. I, t- I did the test twice. Like I turned in, you know, I turned in every th- two versions of everything in the test and I definitely was a try hard, you know, and, <laughs> but like, but I didn't like overwork everything. I just, I just generated a lot mm-hmm. and I got the gig and it was fun because like, I didn't really know what I was doing. And the way that they, the way that they tested me f- for the gig is like, well, I took the test and then they called me to come into the studio to do some freelance. And I went in house for like two weeks to work on um, uh, Coco from like the Coco Puffs cereal, mm, like redesigned. Mm-hmm. They were they were pitching uh, to the studio was called Noodle Soup Productions. And they were pitching to get the job to do a to do like the General Mills gig or whatever. And I went in there and it was that's sort of how they tested me was like they 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 liked my drawings, but they wanted to see how I could kind of handle a professional environment and, and it was great. So myself and this incredible designer named Chris George, he and I um, went in for the Cocoa Puffs thing. And then he and I were the first two people to be the character designers. And then actually, luckily my buddy, Rick Lacey, he, uh, he was a year older than me in school. He was supposed to be on like the layout team, character layout team. And they cut the department and then uh, they ended up making a character design spot for for Rick. So it was awesome because I I was able to start venture as a character designer, and we did props and, and uh, as well. But you know we it was myself, my friend Rick, who was really talented, a year older than me at school, and this guy Chris George, who was from Philly, you know had worked on a couple shows like he worked on Downtown, um, mm-hmm. he worked on like Lizzie McGuire, you know again New York animation shows, but. But like Chris 
was just super professional. Like he just had a really methodical approach to everything he did, super organized. And I learned so much sitting between those guys. And it was amazing. It was an awesome first job. And like, you know, it kind of spoiled me a bit because it's a it's a scripted show and we designed pre-board. So we did everything before the board artists. So the board artists really had to follow everything we did as designers. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah. the board artists weren't even, re- at the time, weren't even allowed to invent anything. They like had to use the layouts that the BG artists were, were doing. They had to, you know, they couldn't really even adjust scale. They couldn't invent characters. If I had to do like a, you know, if I was doing a bunch of henchmen or something for, you know, whatever, like, some weird villain had a bunch of you know mm-hmm. spies yeah, sure it was like oh okay i did three spies and that was it those are the three versions you know how did that affect the the pipeline because i that's an interesting approach do you feel mm-hmm. like that was like better or was it just kind of different it's different so what ends up happening is as a character designer you have a little bit more ownership of the design because you're only you only have a script or maybe, mm-hmm. you know, maybe a sketch or two from Jackson, the creator, or, you mm-hmm. know, our, our design team supervisor. But you really didn't have anything to go off of. It was pretty much white page. But everything was, like, front three-quarter, back three-quarter. So it was, like, very stiff drawings. Mm-hmm. But, like, but you were authoring the whole thing. And then your designs would get into the board artist's hands. And then there was a pretty intense, like, board cleanup process. So, like, that pipeline was, again, the board artist would take it. And then uh, there was sort of it was like revisions, but it it was it was a little bit more like mini layout where they would pose out and and kind of really tighten it down more. And that show was unique, and it's it probably has has changed since. But like there were multiple directors on each episode writing X sheets, and they sat in the same row as the like, kind of the board cleanup artists. So there was this like different. It was like the board really was layout, and the and the timing directors were sitting with that group of people. So it was like you they we really were kind of kind of keying out the show in house to some degree. Mm. So like like the idea of like a special pose, I did, the designers didn't touch that. That was all in the hands of the board cleanup people. Man, that's such a different pipeline that i'm used to it was so (laughs) different and it really you know it it, but that's kind of how a lot of new york was done because new york Mm. again like it wasn't born out of the same production pipeline as la you know it wasn't Mm. a board driven environment it was script driven in fact you know the uh, the um the second show i worked on was the show called catbot and you don't know it because it was one of the worst shows ever. <laughs> but uh, it was a Disney TV show, and all of the scripts were being written in LA. And we would get them on our desks, you know, uh, in in New York. And like we had no interaction with with you know with the writers. And like that was sort of we we would just get the scripts in and we would break them down. But it was it was a totally different type of a process. But that's the show that like. You got me to LA though, because that show, I worked on it for, I forget, maybe eight months or so. The show got shut down. The art director was this guy, Steven DiStefano, who, who worked on the Venture Brothers and became a mm-hmm. mentor to me. And, mm-hmm. and Steven had worked on Ren and Stimpy and he was like an LA person. He was from New York, but had moved out to LA, worked on Ren and Stimpy, uh, worked on a bunch of stuff out here and then, and then moved back to New York so he became a close friend and, and a real mentor. And then our producer, I guess he was kind of, he was kind of our showrunner, but but because we had writing happening on the on the West Coast as well, it was this guy Randy Myers. And Randy was like, you know, he was a timing director on on Powerpuff and Samurai Jack, and you know, he was a classmate of Gendy and Craig's, and, and Randy's just someone who was in LA in the LA industry for a long time. And he was in New York doing the show, and the show ended. And Randy said to me, come to L.A., like, come, come, you know, fly out and, you know, check out the studios. And and I think I think you can get a job in L.A., Phil. There's not much happening in New York. You should check it out. And I didn't want to go. I was really, you know, stubborn. I was probably still a little hurt about not getting into CalArts. And I just was like, no, I, again, that that fake rivalry we were talking about existed. Mm-hmm. So Randy ended up. I flew to Burbank. He picked me up at the Burbank airport. 
let's see, like he put me to the Burbank Airport. It was Memorial Day, I guess, and 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 we, he was like, we're gonna go to a friend's house for a barbecue. And this is like the this is like the humblest brag ever, but yeah. it, it really was like a, the difference was he picks me up. We go to his friend's house. His friend is Gendy Tartakovsky. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and I'm in Gendy's house. We're like the first people at the party. Gendy hands me a hot dog. And I'm like, what? What? A, I'm like, what the fuck is happening? What like, a magical, like, yeah. Yeah, I was like, this guy is like one of my animation heroes. He just handed me a hot dog. I'm in his. I'm in his house. I'm talking yeah. to his wife and meeting his kids, mm-hmm. and like all of a sudden, like you know, all of these people showed up at this party that I only knew their names from credits, and you know, I, like Aaron Springer, Paul Rudish, Dan Crawl, Chris Savino. Like all of these people there at this party, and it was kind of this this Cartoon Network crew of people that that, that I just knew. And like I remember sitting, kind of sheepishly in the corner and talking to um, Derek Bachman, who's who's a writer. He he wrote I think he wrote Primal, and he's been writing with Gendy oh, wow. for a long time. Mm-hmm. But Derek's like one of the nicest guys, and like was just just hanging out. And I just hung out with Derek this entire party and i think derek was like a production coordinator coordinator at the time and it was just mind it was mind-boggling so that was literally day one visiting la i didn't even bring a portfolio and then randy convinced me like culture shock it was it was culture shock and it was like holy shit like it it was that difference like you know like i loved working in 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 new york i had a great time that catbot show was was a terrible show but we had an amazing experience actually like pete Browngard, who's doing the looney tunes show and pete created uncle grandpa and secret mountain fort awesome pete mm-hmm. sat behind me on that show because he he's from long island but went to cal arts did a little bit of work on the west coast but moved back to the east coast so i met pete on that show and like you know pete was like go to la phil you can always come back you can always come back to new york sure Mm -hmm. so yeah i mean again that trip i ended up coming out and then i got an opportunity and then i got some freelance to work on um the grim adventures of billy and mandy and i ended up landing a job and i like i basically i visited la in may and i moved to la in july i broke my lease in new york and i just left i just left and you know it was you know i my friends were sort of shocked in new york because i literally picked up and left oh yeah sure yeah it was kind of fast right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah that's funny i i think we we had talked about this a long time ago but i had this a similar thing with gendy where i like had like a family friend that turned because i'm russian he's russian and apparently we all know each other somehow and i <laughs> i like and it turned out like yeah like there was a family friend of ours who was uh related to him and they invited us to a wedding and they were like casually i was like yeah i want to go work in animation and they were like Oh yeah, my uncle Gendy works in animation in, in Burbank. And I was like, the like you mean like Gendy, right? Like Gendy. Like there's not another Gendy in animation. And you're like, yeah, Gendy Tartakovsky, yeah, that's like my uncle. And I was like, Oh my god. And so they had to like they had to call me down. And then um they invited me to like a wedding reception and I got to meet him. And it was the same thing where I like met his wife and was like sh- giving giving him pitch Bibles that then he gave to his kids to look at, <laughs> just like flip through. And he was really nice. They like spent like an hour just chatting with me and like it was the same thing. And he told me to he's like, You gotta move to LA. He's like he's like, You you know, you have talent, but like you're not gonna be able to make it from a distance. Yeah. And I was so dead set on making getting into animation. And then like, yeah, I think it was probably like six months later. I moved out. I I didn't go to LA first, but I, I began my, my journey. And um yeah, it's it's unfortunate that everything kind of happens in LA and I hope that that does change, but it does. If you want to make a good career out of it, you, you kind of kind of have to be here. I think that's changing though. I think it is changing. I think it's, I think a silver lining of COVID is that from home, that there's a lot of, a lot of studios, not just studios, but like, I think people are realizing like, Oh, we can do this with people all over, you know, remotely and all over the world. So which is wild that it like took this. I, I feel like with the way technology was moving, that was always possible for like 10 years, probably. And I, you know, I think yeah. some it's, I think it was interesting is like some product it's, I think before it was like production to production. Like I definitely remember, you know, 
like I would say like on Billy and Mandy and even on Chowder and maybe even a bit on Adventure Time, like you would almost never see board artists. Like board artists would never be at their desks because they would work from home. They wouldn't come yeah. in. They would get their board. They'd have their six weeks or whatever to do to do their assignment. And though and like I guess Adventure Time was a little bit different because those were teams. But but Chowder and Billy and Mandy were solo board teams. So just solo board jobs. And like those people would get their handouts and just be gone. So I think it has happened. I think I think people have done it, but. It wasn't so normal. I also think a lot of it is concentration of talent was like mm. the talent was in L.A. So it was very easy for, for this to happen. The schools were in L.A. Yeah, the schools is a big one. And I think that like the schools globally are better and better. I think that I think it's like a it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more people can work remotely, the more they can then potentially teach locally. And then the talent will get better wherever they are. And then it will kind of keep creating this thing but it it took an event like covid to like push push everything to the other side right like before you could just go you have to be in la and people would move you know or you know even if they needed visas yeah also um it's also like uh i mean from my personal experience it's just like you know it's easier to hire people that you know yeah yeah you just meet people if you're in la if all the industries in la you're just going to meet people in LA because you can like you, not not saying that I'm like pro or like against like the industry being like in yeah. in just a single city but what I've noticed for me like coming from France all the way to LA is like now I get it I get it why it's happening the way it is it's because like you meet, you meet people at parties and, and you see kind of who they are as a person yeah, whereas when insular. you only see them see their art, artwork online it's a little bit harder to kind of get an idea like oh how how do they deal with a schedule or like what's yeah. their personality like or you know all that all that the human part of it i guess that's also kind of a result of it being such a studio culture too i think that like having done a little freelance having been hired for freelance while i've been work from home it you know they they knew my work and they were like yeah he can do it <laughs> and it was that was it and so they like hired, you know they sent me paperwork the day that i started i did the work for two weeks and then i was done and it didn't matter like how easy it was to work with or anything although i am everyone employers i'm still looking <laughs> but yeah it's just like you could hire anybody you could hire anybody from nv i mean you know you were in tokyo when we were freelancing for loud house so it's like it shouldn't matter it shouldn't matter, and I, I think it would probably help the industry at large because you're creating, it's like Phil was saying, like you're creating these communities that can help themselves. But if, if everything's constantly funneling through L.A., it it blocks out a lot of potential talent that's out there that can't move or, or, or doesn't want to move. Honestly, fuck it. Like, why should they? Yeah. You know, there's, there's plenty of places to live. And then we get to the situation where it's just like, it's expensive to live here. And so even though we're making good money, it's not much like it's not enough in the face of like LA real estate prices or anything or rent even. I think that all those things are like just constantly in flux, you know, like yeah. it's just, yeah. it's a system that's co- that like will write itself, but it's going to do it in, in imbalanced, right? Like with, with the cost of housing in LA that will eventually drop if people aren't here right if the demand goes down sure totally. so it's like it's like it's just sort of what where where is the pendulum and what what edge of it are you on as it's swinging mm-hmm. you know i think it's all it's it's all it will change it has changed it will continue to change and i think that's okay it mm-hmm. should yeah yeah it should it should change so venture brothers brought you to la you met uh well yeah you came to la you had that um meet up and then kind of what happened from there so I got into Cartoon Network. So I worked on, you know, I I did I freelanced at most at a bunch of the studios. Um, I met one of my best friends in the world, Andy Seriano. He was developing mm-hmm. the Plastic Man show at Warner Brothers, and I helped mm-hmm. him on that. And then he, you know, he's he's become a great friend, and um, I slept on his couch when I first moved to LA. A couple of hairy boys. Yes, yes, we definitely are. <laughs> you know, and he's and he's amazing, and like you know, just one of those people like that became a, a, just an instant close friend. Um, yeah, and he's just great, good, good human. Yeah, so I worked on, and this is right, like this is typically, and this is very different than New York. Is like 
you get on a crew and then sometimes the crew travels together. So a lot of the Billy and Mandy crew went on to Chowder because Carl Greenblatt, who created Chowder, he was a Billy and Mandy board artist. So a, a lot of us went over to went over to Chowder. Um, I did that for a couple seasons, still still designing characters, but then I kind of got the itch to learn how to board. So I, I moved to revisions and I boarded uh, a couple of episodes. But I didn't, I don't know, this is where, like, I didn't, it was a board-driven show, and I didn't make films, I didn't really have a voice for myself, so it was really hard to, like, author stories, it wasn't, it, it wasn't what I was necessarily great at, so I sort of, I struggled as a, as a story artist, because I, I just wasn't as comfortable as a storyteller, but at the same time, Flapjack was in production and Penn Ward was was working on that, and I had loved the Adventure Time short. Amanda, my now wife, we we met uh, when I was working on Billy and Mandy, and she had a she, she had a uh, her short film in a festival at the same time as Adventure Time, and I got to meet Penn and, and saw Adventure Time in a festival and was like, this is mind blowing. I absolutely love it. And it was su- it was already like really polarizing. There were people who loved it, and people who just were like, "This is the worst thing ever." Really? That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. That is so interesting. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Oh no, it was That's very so polarizing. Cool. Short. You can probably go back. There's actually like I, you know, there's a Cartoon Brew article that really? that is that like they posted it, and because I think Penn won like the what's it called the Platform Film Festival or something. I don't know. Yeah. And it was in Portland and. He, he like won it with the Adventure Time short that pilot that got on YouTube. And the I remember the comment thread about it was like just a lot of like industry pros just talking about how mm. awful it was. And then like I remember Alex Hirsch commented on it and he was like doing boards on Flapjack. He might have even uh, he might have finished school at that point. But like I remember Alex was on there talking about how great it was and how brilliant it was. And like it was a real moment of change in in television and i knew i wanted to work on it um i just was like i want to be part of that show so i i sort of i've told the story before so i I won't but i basically stalked pen like we had met before but like we're both at cartoon network and i would just sort of like just try to say hi to him he was the shy person and i and i knew he was only going to hire his friends and people he knew because that's what a lot of people do especially when when creators are young because why wouldn't you hire those people in your circle it's weird to take a risk on on a stranger yes right especially when you're young and you're and you've got like you know you feel like you've got all this pressure yeah mm-hmm. so so i sort of just tried to not befriend Penn, but I just, I wanted to be a little bit of a more familiar face. And I ended up taking a board test. I didn't get the board job. I took a character design test. And I actually didn't get the job at first. There was someone else in the position, but they were struggling. Um, they were only in it for a couple of weeks and it wasn't going super well. And then this director, Larry Likeletter, came up to me and said, Phil, you know, I really loved your portfolio. I think you might have approached the test a little bit wrong. Um, and he, you know, he asked me to do a character turn to show to show Penn and Pat and Adam Muto, like w- what I was capable of. So I ended up doing a character turn and, and P- Penn came into my cubicle on Chowder and was like, you know, the way I remember it was he just said to me, like, how did you do that? And I said, and I was like, what do you mean? And, and he said, you did two characters one you made it look like i drew it and one you made it look like adam muto drew it and and i was like oh yeah because i just followed the drawings like i didn't change anything i just i just drew the way you guys draw and like he was shocked and i don't think that i don't think he realized that like part of the character design job is sometimes to like kind of ape somebody else This is something, okay, this is something that is so funny and it makes me really happy that you tell this story because this is something that, like, for me in France, this is the only way that we hire people because, you know, like, there's not that many jobs. So, like, you know that you have to emulate whatever the show you you apply for is, right? Like, you know you have to draw to get the, to understand what the show is, the humor and all that and the way it's drawn. And then, and then you just kind of, you create something new from something that's like already existing, but you don't, you don't change it, right? You don't change the style of it. Yeah. But it's so funny to me what you said that like, I do feel like sometimes out here in LA, I do get sometimes the sensation taking tests here. It wasn't the case on the Loud House. On the Loud House, it was very straightforward. It was like, this is exactly what we want you to emulate. And this is the, the new 
bit of script that we want to you know, see you emulate on. And but like all the other shows that I've like tested on here, it's not very clear. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like yes. it's not very clear like what they want you as someone who tests to to emulate. You know? Uh, you know. So, uh testing i know like testing is a is a hot topic right i know that it's very it's a very polarizing topic i am a mm -hmm. i sit on the pro i'm very pro testing i think it's an important part of the process it's it's auditioning i think yeah, if, it's like if testing, you can like it's like a testing call mm -hmm. yeah and i think you can pay people to test i, I don't think yeah that, um yeah. i don't think mm -hmm. unpaid testing is the thing but i do think the audition process is okay but i don't think tests should be tricks and yes. so I mm -hmm. totally agree with you, V. Like I, mm -hmm. I think it's you know, and I've helped put together lots of tests, and I think it's like give people everything they need to succeed, mm -hmm. because then you'll be able to really find the people who can do it or they can't. And I'll tell you, like when I te when I tested for Adventure Time, there was a lot of people that tested for it, and and more than 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 probably should have when when they were first trying to hire that job. And I would run into people who were friends, who were, you know, had way more experience in the industry than me. And um, people were like, oh, how's it going? And, you know, what are you working on? And I was like, oh, I, you know, I just took the Adventure Time test or whatever. And then people would say, oh, I took that test. And people would say it was the easiest test I ever took in my life. And I said to them, it was the hardest test I ever took in my life. And and I realized that, like, and it's, it's why I got the job, was that, like, I think when people took that test, they saw what Penn was trying to do and they sort of simplified it and fixed Interesting. it. Interesting. They fixed yeah. it. And I didn't. I really tried to, to, to kind of keep to the integrity of what Penn was doing. I didn't, I didn't like clean it up. I didn't, I didn't solve right. the problems. I, I celebrated the idiosyncratic stuff um, mm -hmm. in those drawings. And honestly, like, some of that probably really does go back to my time life drawing in, in Jim's class was it was like I wanted to like respect the specificity of what Penn was doing versus boiling mm -hmm. it down into something that maybe was simpler or more palatable or, or, or more obvious. And mm -hmm. it's I think it's part of why I got that job. And and when I when I started testing people to come and be on my design team people who I love that I, that are great designers, we, they couldn't do it because they just were so trained to like solve the problem instead of like honor the problem. You know, I, I, it's a weird, it's a weird metaphor I'm trying to say, no, but like, yeah. you know, it was really odd. And it's funny because Pat and I joked about this was like in the beginning of Adventure Time, we couldn't find anyone to draw like us. And then by the time Pat and I left Adventure Time, we both left. Um, Pat, I think, left after second season. I left in the middle of the third season. We were joking because all of a sudden we were seeing drawings that we that we didn't even know if we did them or other people would do them. Because oh, wow. in the course oh, of those couple of years, it changed the way people were drawing. You know, all of a sudden there was like a generation of, of college students or, you know, or, or fans or, or whoever that were, were doing things that were like totally against the rules when we had started Adventure Time. And then all of a sudden there were tons of people out there in the world making decisions that like, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't force people to make. And then, and then, and then there was this generation of people who got it. And, you know, in some ways that's great. But in other ways, it was tough because, like, now, talking about pendulums, like, getting people to, like, to go back to the other direction is hard because it's, mm -hmm. like, it's, like, the industry has shifted in, in, in one direction. But, you know, it's now it's, like, trying to find other types of drawings and types of stuff. But it was pretty wild to be at the start of a real change and, and to be part of it. Yeah, it was such a huge shift in in the style of animation because I guess yeah, huge yeah, then it was, I feel like it was like go ahead, V. Oh, I was just gonna say it's funny because in Europe we had the gumball effect. Everybody started oh. drawing like gumball. Yeah, yeah. Gumball. That's true. It's a great it's looking okay. show. I feel like up until Adventure Time, there was a strong like UPA influence on stuff. It was that like second generation of of UPA, which you know the the Craigs, the Gendys, all the way probably up until even Billy and Mandy feels like there was a, that the very strong like shape language, and then yeah, Adventure Time feels like it broke that. Yeah, I mean there was definitely that. There was definitely there's like the you know I would say Flapjack 
was like a weird combination of some of that thinking a little bit with some of some of the Ren and Stimpy kind of feeling mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. But like board driven became so board artist style driven and very expressive. And a lot of that was SpongeBob. I, actually, like I should say, like Flapjack That's was true. very much even in the SpongeBob yeah. world, which SpongeBob was almost more classic in in some of its um approach yeah, sure. than mm-hmm. than 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 some of the stuff and a lot of what we did on adventure time was almost spongebobby because we would you know there are a lot of parallel lines in spongebob and you know that was like no parallels like at cartoon network it was like a huge no-no mm. um, on oh, most yeah. shows but some shows you could do it and and but yeah it was it was a weird one and there was just a certain like simplicity and well you know what it was too was like adventure time was simple but structured so like i think a lot of people and this is where that like to me like the the fake upa thing is like people Mm -hmm. see it and they think it's flat because it's graphic but like if you go and really watch like gerald mcboing boing or rudy toot toot like and you're you know and you watch a character turn their head like mm-hmm. those are super volumetric drawings. They're just they're just very flat in a still, but everything works in space. And that's kind of what the theory on Adventure Time was, was like we don't care if it's just two dots and a line for a nose, you know, or I mean for a face, you know, two dots for eyes and a line for a mm-hmm. line for a mouth. But like that face like has to it yeah. should be on the surface of a cylinder or a sphere and it needs to move in space on a form. And I think that's what really tripped people up because they saw simple shapes and they just thought flat, but it wasn't I flat. See. It was very round. You're saying that I'm realizing how much of an influence that was on me. Cause I'm drawing, <laughs> I'm drawing these like little frogs with just like two lines and, and, uh, but I'm trying to put them in that 3d space. And I think that was a big, I mean, that was, that was a big influence. I remember, I remember online after the short came out on DeviantArt, the art that people would start posting on DeviantArt was completely shifting. Oh yeah. Yeah. Everybody started drawing like adventure time. Mm-hmm. It was like a big, yeah, it was so. I still see it. I can still see the ripple in, in, in like indie artists and shit. Cause everyone that was, everyone that's 30 now was, you know, 18 oh, yeah. when it dropped oh, yeah. yeah and so you see that you can see like it's like this web of influence that you can see trace back to adventure time and, and scott pilgrim i feel like it was another like uh, almost around the same time it was like these two big uh these yeah. uh, ripples that happen but it's funny to talk about the the journey and and i know that we're we're running along and there's probably a lot more stuff you guys want to talk to me about but like sure the uh like where like the the coming from new york full circle thing happened which was great was like I, again, I had to be super versatile in New York, and and when we were staffing for the show, it was like who I don't I don't want people who bring all of the habits from the last shows that they worked on. So you know, the first person I hired was Tom Herpick, who again was a classmate at SVA. But I was like, Tom might be a genius, and I think he can. He's going to get it. Like he's going to be able to do this. So I hired him as a designer, and then he moved over to boards. You know, after a season, Ian and Rebecca were both in New York. Uh, Ian Jones, Cordy, and Rebecca Sugar, and like I showed Penn their student films, and Penn was like, I remember showing the films, and he was like, they both need to come here and direct, and I was like, they're just graduating college. Like I think Ian just finished, and and Rebecca's about to finish school. And, and Rebecca came out as a revisionist at first. Uh, and I think Rebecca had a hard time getting a job, getting jobs in New York because she was just doing something that, that wasn't totally appreciated there. But I mm. knew she would thrive on Adventure Time because we wanted people with a certain, with a different POV. So, yeah, so I guess Rebecca came out doing revisions and then, and then probably a few months later, Ian came out. I think he worked on Secret Mountain fort awesome before he came over to adventure time but no 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 that's not true he did come over to adventure time um and then and then he moved over to secret mountain but like it was fun to kind of get some of these you know comics people new york people really different types of people working on that show because because it was a it was it it, you know you know you were talking about hiring the people you know like on that Mm -hmm. show it, it it couldn't have just it couldn't be just an la show because Hiring the people you knew would 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 produce an end product that was 
not what we were looking for. We weren't looking for the right. show that we all knew that other people worked on. We we're trying to do something totally different. So Penn and Pat were really open to new types of people. And, um, and you know, and I really liked it. I really love training people up. I mean, you know, Natasha Allegri, myself and Tom were the first designers on the show. And Natasha, I don't think she ever finished college. And like, you know, she was like all ideas and I had to really get her up to speed with kind of volumetric drawing and she could do it by accident, but she, mm. but she wasn't really doing it intentionally. So like part of, part of my job with being lead on that show was also to like take the superpowers from Tom and Natasha and like help them organize their ideas and their, and their drawings into a way that could really work for production. So mm. it was super fun, but you know, okay. So I'm going to go fast because there's, so I worked on that show and then I I ended up freelancing on the pilot for Gravity Falls and Hirsch I had met when he was working at Jib Jab because Amanda was working at Jib Jab mm-hmm. and um, he, you know, he ended up sleeping on our couch one night and he was on Flapjack and um, was just a friendly guy. And uh, so I got hired to do some early development work on the pilot. And then when the show started staffing, I got a, I got a call from someone else who I met when they were still at CalArts, but Joe Pitt, who who Alex had hired to start doing characters. And um, and I know that a lot of my early development work, they were referencing. And uh, and Joe was like, Phil, who should we hire? Because we can't, we're, you know, we're looking at a lot of your work. Who would you recommend? And I just said, well, why don't you guys like offer me a job? And, <laughs> and why not? And, uh, and Joe was like, well, you're like really, you know, or maybe it was Alex was talking at that point. They were like, well, you're like important on Adventure Time. And I was like, yeah, I know, but it's third season and people are doing their thing. And like the show is going really well. And, you know, I, I'm going to, I'll miss this show, but like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to work on Adventure Time for the rest of my life. Like, right. you know, and Gravity Falls is really cool. So, so Disney ended up, you know, making me a job offer to come over. I was credited as production designer. I was really, I really had a similar job as I did on Adventure Time. The only difference was that there were a lot of people who hadn't worked in television when we, when we had first started. So, you know, Ian Worrell, who's the art director, who's amazing, incredible artist, came from Jib Jab. I knew Ian when he was at Jib Jab, but he'd never worked on a series production, but creatively he was the right person. So I think part of, part of me going into that role was just to sort of, all of a sudden I was like old man cartoon, you know, like I, I, I had the experience that a lot of the people on the team didn't. And, um, so I went over, I, I worked on gravity for, I think about a year, like I think 13 half hours or so I worked on, I freelanced on the Lego movie, um, just a couple of weeks, but it was really fun. And then, um, and then I got an offer to go back to cartoon network in this sort of like, it was sort of the, like the hybrid, job of of all of a sudden becoming an executive because i was i was the creative director for their shorts program which really was their pilots program and i i worked on the pilots that were going into not into series production but the but the boards that were greenlit to pilot production so fully animated pilots and you know the the projects were with people who i knew and some of the projects were with people who i helped get their jobs at cartoon network so it was really easy to step into that role so I worked on Steven Universe and OKKO OK and Tom of the well Over the Garden Wall it became and then um, We Bear Bears and you know kind of kind of like this amazing class of 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 projects and in this really cool role where like I was full time in development I had this leadership position I was working with lots of different um, filmmakers and I was helping them navigate not just the production process, but also like putting their team together. So I, I was like super interested in making sure we were hiring the right people for every job and making sure we were testing out people. And and like, I always was like freelancing to illustrators or cartoonists or people who don't speak animation. You know, we were, you know, like Ian was really excited to work with, with Lamar Abrams, who's a comics artist. And Lamar was, I think maybe in Baltimore at the time. And, you know, Lamar did some back, some character designs for us on the OKKO pilot. And then he ended up, you know, coming out to work on Steven as a board artist. And he's amazing. Angie Wang, who, uh, oh yeah, Angie, was it Angie? Yeah. We hired to do prop designs on the Steven Universe pilot. And she just, 
was awesome. But it was so funny because we would hire these illustrators and they would try to draw what they think cartoons look like. Mm -hmm. And I would, no matter who it was, there would always be, they would turn in their first round of stuff and then, and then I would call them or get on the phone or send them an email. And I'm like, this is great. Next round, don't draw like us. Like, I just want you to draw like you and then we'll talk about it. And it was so funny. Like everybody would make the same mistake, which is like, how do I, how do I fix it? Or how do I change what I'm doing? It's like, no, I didn't hire you to draw like someone else. Like this is development. I want you to just be you. So I did that for a couple of years and it was really fun there. And that's sort of where that kind of that, that the, the, the real career shift happened was like, that was a, I sort of sat halfway between a creative role and an executive role. I was still drawing, but not doing very much of it. I was, you know, sitting side by side with, with these filmmakers and, you know, staffing projects, helping first timers, helping put teams together. I would even kind of, kind of, kind of hang out even into first season with some of these shows as they got greenlit just to help things get set up and, and, and be there for, for each of those filmmakers and their teams. And then Nickelodeon called and, you know, it, it was like a, it was an amazing meeting because uh, Jenna Boyd, who hired me at, at Nickelodeon, we went to the same high school. We're from the same small town in South Jersey. We yeah. both, we both had twins, like really small world, str- yeah. super oh, wow. small world, like super yeah. small world. But the craziest thing was that in that meeting, she had no idea that I was an artist. She only thought I was a development person and a development wow. exec. And like at the end of the meeting, she she basically was like, oh, I didn't even know you were an artist. I have to get you to come over to join us at Nickelodeon. And so for a year, she kind of kept talking to me and, and you know, you know like not, not offering me jobs or anything, but just kind of just – keeping in touch, seeing how things were going. And then right as my contract was, was coming to an end at Cartoon Network, she made me an offer to go be a vice president at, um, at Nick. That's nuts. And it was like That's a nuts. real shock. Cause it was, I don't know. I feel very fortunate in my career where like, I've been able to navigate it. I've been able to put myself out there enough where I get to know people, people see my impact and then, and then, and then opportunities sometimes present themselves, you know, like I've, I've definitely had to like, it's, you know, it's, it's still a rat race. There's still a lot of like doing it for myself, but like, I think I'm just constantly doing it. And then it was just this fortuitous moment where, where I was thinking about making this kind of a change and it wasn't going to happen at Cartoon Network at that moment. And Nickelodeon was willing to, to give me a shot and, and it was terrifying because all of a sudden I wasn't a union member anymore. Oh, sure. It was, yeah. it was a really different thing. Like essentially most of the skills that I, you know, had developed as an artist weren't the skills I needed at work, you know, like it was totally different kinds of stuff. But, you know, I've, I think I've always been a curious person. I've always enjoyed people. I like learning. So that helped me jump in there. And at the time, like Nick was in the middle of a big transition and they were still really fi- trying to figure out who they were. And, uh, and it was good. And I think I represented something unique to them and, you know, and it was a little bit more of that, like kind of creative spirit, like the artist spirit inside of the, inside of the machine. They were, they were excited to get back to So I know I had a lot of impact there and, and it was good. And it's, you know, I, that's how I met both of you too. I mean, I remember Mm -hmm. seeing your work V online and I got to meet you at CTN. You were, you know, you were in, you know, I think you were in, in Japan at the time and. Oh yeah. 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 CTN was just right after Japan. Yeah. 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 You know, so we met you there and then, and then, and then Gene, like I saw your 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 Planet Panic stuff online, and I just was blown yeah. away by your kind of motion comics. And then and then that was the the first year I ran the shorts program. We did mm-hmm. that Comic Con thing where we were supposed mm-hmm. to buy a project at Comic Con, which was not my favorite thing that we had to do. Um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm really not excited about this. But you know, and it was like we had a couple of rules. It really was like no ringers, like no one that just no one who who we know, no one who works oh, in animation, yeah, no one who does that. And I just remember 
being a fan of of your comic gene and i i wrote you when i was like please oh, please pitch me something it was it was like from my perspective i was I think I was either unemployed or doing like freelance in San Francisco and I was like desperate to come to LA and uh, really the comic I did specifically to catch someone's attention. It was like something I wanted to make and I was like, I'm just going to pour everything I have into this thing because I'm tired of being on the fringes. And then, yeah, you like messaged me over Facebook. And I like, I had to like get up and like lay face down on the, on the bed for like a minute. Cause I was just like, I think this is it. I was like, I think this is like, this is like the moment I need to seize to like really to make make it happen for myself. And I was already going to Comic Con. I I was going every year f- because I was hustling and trying to you know get noticed. And so it's funny that you were. I totally know why it was not exciting for you, but for me, I was like, "Fuck you!" I was like, "I gotta bring it." <laughs> and so I'm like, well, you yeah. did. Well, you yeah. know, you did, but we didn't pick yours. You we know? didn't. Yeah, yeah. We didn't pick your short. I, you were, yours was the one that I wanted to make, but I got outvoted in, yeah, when well. we were when we were when we were picking. But you know, but it was, but you know, at the end of the day, it was fine because we got to meet you and and see your work, and then you know that's that eventually well, tra- transitioned into getting you a gig yeah. on the loud house and then um or helping to get you amazing, in the yeah. loud house mm-hmm. and then uh but then we did get to make your short which was awesome the following year yeah yeah it, it all worked out but like mm-hmm. it, even just because you invited me to like the nick party at the uh the hard rock hotel <laughs> oh yeah and like which was a tiny miserable little party but um it was like just packed full and sweaty and hot but i i met so many people that became so instrumental later which is so it, it's it's just this weird thing it's like you were saying you know like you 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 meet the people and then they somehow all end up being important later it's just like you kind of gravitate towards the the kind of people you want to be in your life like we formed a dance circle just because we were bored and tired of like trying to yell over all these industry artists and then like donnie mckayley showed up and like you know how that how big of a role he's been playing in, in panic and then like hiro Hiron from from nick who was uh, a production assistant on panic later you know like two years later and is still a, a good friend and like all these people that were still like so important and it was because we didn't want to keep talking to people and we started a, a dance circle in front of the dj booth because no one was participating and we attracted all the people that we ended up being friends with you know because mm-hmm. they had the same energy they had the same vibe and it's like cool. it's just a it's a funny thing and it's you know i don't know people in animation are are brought together because there's a real shared love for mm-hmm. for something that's like bigger than themselves or their own aspirations and it's an it's like this where where this weird version of the entertainment business where like most of the entertainment business it's it can be gig based right there's a lot of 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 working on different productions but because we still dig in and work on these productions for a long time you're like the deck does constantly get reshuffled but you but you you sit side by side with people long enough to really build relationships so like your people do keep popping up in your in your career because like mm-hmm. i said the, the the deck keeps getting shuffled but like they can have some real impact because of the amount of time you 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 can spend with with these people so mm-hmm. it's it's really i love it i mean it really is amazing it's always surprising yeah the stuff it's it's uh anytime i'll have some big opportunity or something click it's like somebody that i met three years ago and i never would have guessed that that would manifest somehow which is <laughs> that's something we've talked about i think on the show before is that like you don't want to network you want to just be a cool person and you want to just make friends because yeah. like yeah. it comes off really artificial when somebody starts handing out business cards at a party that was meant to just be like hang out and smoke weed or whatever you know yeah. and it's like <laughs> hey dude like <laughs> this is not what we're doing here and it immediately puts a bad taste in everyone's mouth but yeah. you're just cool man people remember it's true it's like you know you got to be yourself and it's hard and some people it's it's yeah it's a it's faster and like luck is a huge piece of it right like yeah you know i you know i'll say like coming out to la was you know i took that billy and mandy test and that exact same moment was like essentially when 2d animation was like pretty much done in los angeles so the majority of the portfolios mm-hmm. that were floating around town were were former Disney feature animators or DreamWorks feature animators. And then me, like uh-huh. we- weirdo New York 
cartoonist guy with these, you know, life drawings and, you know, strange looking portfolio samples from all these shows that people didn't even know about because they were either killed in development or never made it um, out there. But I had a, such a different perspective, you know, and I was lucky. It, I was just so lucky that 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 Adam Burton, Maxwell Adams on on Billy and Mandy, mm-hmm. that my portfolio, he saw it probably right after looking at a dozen feature cleanup artists, you know, and those portfolios were probably beautiful, but just not what he needed. And then all of a sudden my portfolio was just so different. So like totally luck, like total, total luck in terms of the timing for me to come out here. So for sure. There's always a factor and, but you know, and I think we even talked about this at one point, but it's like, there's luck, but then there's also creating those opportunities and like you want to, you want to be present and you want to have a body of work that you can point people to and put in front of people's eyes. And so like you want to create those opportunities, you want to pull as many like slot machine levers as you can. You know, if you're only doing the one machine, your chances aren't as good. Yeah. You did say like, you know, like you say that it was all luck, but like you, you did try to get into CalArts twice. So it's not like it was your first, time ever trying to go to LA that's true so it was like a lot of drive as well (laughs) you could you could focus on the on the positives or you could focus on the failures you know and it kind of and so like yeah I'm sure we all have have had many many downs in our career and that was probably not great but we keep going and that's what matters is like we just keep pushing and yeah it's something uh, that I like to I like to talk about it mostly just because it, it is like I think it's important to remember that like yeah things are not probably going to work out on the first time and that's okay yeah. it's just about like you know uh yeah like okay well if this does, didn't work kind of take, taking a little bit of time to kind of like think about it and then like keep going and just like keep trying uh mm-hmm. i think yeah when you're when, when you're really passionate about it then like it's not that easy to give up <laughs> Yeah. Um, so then, uh, yeah, so you, you were in development at Nick and you helped my short get made. You helped a lot of good shorts get made. And then uh, talk a little bit or a lot about sort of your the end of your time there and then like kind of transition to your current role. Yeah. I mean, you know, Nick was changing, you know, it was uh, the Loud House was like the best worst thing because. Mm-hmm. You know, SpongeBob is a monolith, right? It's such a huge yeah. show, and so and so, not just for Nickelodeon. It 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 it, it can it kind of redefine success for television. And for sure, like, how do we keep that going was definitely a challenge. And and you know, lots of debate around uh, around how do you how do you recapture that? How do you how do you keep things moving? But like, you know, at least the how I remember it was there was a real moment where it was like, OK, not every show is going to be SpongeBob out of the gate and we're going to have to give shows more time to breathe and maybe try some stuff stuff out that's differently, which was great because there was, you know, as a development executive, like there's a lot of pressure to like, how do you prove something's a hit without it giving the opportunity to grow and breathe and mm-hmm. kind of grow into a hit so that that idea that 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 was about to change felt really good. And then the Loud House came out and and it was this wild thing because the Loud House, it was like a one week straight of premieres and it was not the way the network had programmed in the past and, and they were trying something new in the Loud House and it worked. And the Loud House like hit out of the gate in a way that like most shows don't. And so even though we were like, it seemed like projects were going to have a little bit more runway, the Loud House proved that shows could happen in a big mm, way quickly. Yeah. So it was good because it was great for the Loud House and great for Nickelodeon and great yeah, for sure. people involved. But it was also they bad were. because it like it, it it reaffirmed this really difficult thing, which is like Oh. So like for the future shows. Yeah. Maybe? All of a sudden it was like see shows can become huge immediately. Mm. I see. They don't all have to grow. So it was yeah. tough. And honestly, like Nick was changing and you know, I learned a lot at Nickelodeon and I even learned my I learned a lot from my own mistakes and and again this is like a very specific moment in time you know I I, I don't I'm there's some great people there now and, and I know there's a lot of exciting stuff yeah. happening at Nickelodeon and but for me I think I realized like and it was it maybe it's there's probably a, a comparison to some of what I learned as an artist but it was like I I need to find people who want to make shows that are for the people watching Nickelodeon 
versus great shows that I think the people who are watching Nickelodeon might like also. It was this weird thing. And I started thinking about like shows that would sit inside in between SpongeBob and the Loud House. Because it was like those are the shows, those are the bookends. We know these shows work. As I put things into development, how do they sit side by side with those shows? Or would it sit between Ninja Turtles, Ciro's Ninja Turtles, to bring it back to Ciro, yeah, Ciro's right. Ninja Turtles mm-hmm. and SpongeBob, right? These are two big things. What sits in between those? So I sort of like I and my like myself started thinking about things differently. And the team shrunk, right? When I joined the development team, I think there was like six of us on the team, seven of us, maybe eight of us. And then by the time I left, I was like the only VP in the departments and we were down to three or four people. And it really changed and and, and had to start changing some of the thinking around, around what was going to happen. And there was lots of leadership changes and stuff, but it was exciting, but also a little bit frustrating to be, to be totally honest, because it was this transition moment. And I really... I, it was tough because I, I was like, do I do I hang out and, and stay in this role at Nickelodeon as we as this ship starts to turn and reorient itself, or do I do I look for other opportunities? And I wasn't looking for other opportunities, but Jenna, who hired me at uh, Nick, was now working at Netflix, and she had a new boss in, in this woman, Melissa Cobb, and she just said to Melissa, oh, you should meet with Phil. So I. So I got a call from Melissa Cobb, and and um, and I went in for a, a meeting at uh, Netflix, and you know, just a general conversation. It wasn't it wasn't a, a, an interview or anything like that. Just started talking, just you know, just to get to know me. And then you know, she basically said, "Hey, you know, we're thinking about building an animation studio. What do you think? Like like like, what does that mean to you? You know?" And you know, I. I spoke to her about it for a long time. We probably spoke for a couple of hours and we would just talk about, about what an animation studio is and what is, what is building an animation studio today look like. And, and she and I just had lots of really similar opinions about things. And, um, and like the big ones were like, like, how do we, how do we build a studio that, that doesn't orient itself around a certain sp- specific thing whether it's like a, an audience or a tone or a format you know how do we how do we instead we say like let's build a studio around projects being different and variety and 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 a diversity in 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 thinking you know so instead of it being about sameness how do we build a studio that's all about difference which was which was really exciting to think about because sure yeah every place is like oh everyone's making it's just slightly different versions of the same thing. And then, mm-hmm. and then our whole, and, and we were like, we were excited about, well, what if we built a studio that was the opposite of that, where everyone's doing something wildly different from each other. So that was really exciting thinking about what, what streaming could do to the production pipeline and changes some of the, um, the pressures of like turning things over every week for air in television or picking a holiday weekend, you know, years in advance for the, for the feature business was exciting to think about some of those things. Streaming has its own challenges for sure, but it was really exciting to think about something new. So, you know, I I was pretty skeptical at first because I just was like, Netflix already has this big deal with DreamWorks. They can kind of work with anyone in the world. They've got this different type of a position as, as a distribution platform. Mm. But it got, I got really excited uh, talking to her about, about what, it, what it meant. So, you know, my, my, my time was winding down at, at Nickelodeon and Netflix made me an offer to, to come over and I got hired. So I was, the, I was like, I, I was, I've been at Netflix now for over three years. The studio is like, you know, like a little bit over two and a half years old. And I was kind of the first person hired to just start thinking about the studio and only the studio. I mean, Melissa definitely was thinking about the studio. It's, it's why she hired me, but mm-hmm. I had that, I got this, I got this real exciting moment to, to come in and, and, and really start dreaming up what it could be and start trying to build that out. So I did so much weird stuff and I was in <laughs> way over my head in that kind of a job because I'd never been at the start of the studio really um, before. And like, you know, my background is in being an artist 
and being a development executive. So like to come in and have to really think about production or infrastructure or like bigger cool. things where, you know, I wasn't the only person. Luckily there's lots of really talented, smart people that um, we, we hired and, and were able to work with at Netflix, but um, it was cool. And, you know, and so my job has changed a few times there because the studio has grown and, and we've just brought in more and more experts, but something that's been, that's been important for important to me in my whole career and, and really a focus on in my time at Netflix is like, how, how can people influence each other and make each other better? So it's Mm. so much about connecting people, building community and, you know, and really trying to allow people to inspire each other and, Mm. and, and pose like, I don't know, different points of view. Like that's what gets me really excited is, you know, when, when, when you get a, when you can kind of have a room of people together that might actually disagree Mm -hmm. fundamentally, but they all respect each other. And like, that's so exciting. So Mm -hmm. yeah, that is a dream, right? (laughs) It's cool. It's cool. And, you know, and it hasn't been easy and, you know, we're, 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 we're getting there, but like, I don't know. And it's a, it's it's weird it's hard for me to like point at direct impact and like i'm not like it's a big team with with lots of people but like i think that even in the even in the less than three years the studios existed i think we've had a real positive impact across the industry and Mm -hmm. and that's exciting you know and i feel like it feels like a huge accomplishment so it's nice i think i think we've pushed everybody to like to, to to up their game or think about things differently or or challenge maybe their their old ways of doing stuff it's definitely a disruptor yeah and um and it continues to be because i think even in when the pandemic hit like the i feel like netflix was one of the first to like hey we're all going home you know it was <laughs> like there was no discussion from where i was sitting from wh- from where i could see it's like it seemed like everyone was just pressed a button and everyone went home and it's like we'll figure it out whereas other studios were like uh i don't know like how do we keep people stuck here and it's like you don't like just <laughs> just do like you know what you're going to have to do just do it and i think that it was even even that was a huge uh, influence on everyone else because it's like well Netflix went home it was like we could all say to our bosses like yeah I don't know like everyone I know on Netflix is at home right now they just like took their Cintiqs home so what are we doing here it's, so. it's funny because like and it, this is like this is sort of the, the the big Netflix right is like part of the you know we're we, we put our corporate culture out on the internet and 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 there's a lot of interesting discussion and debate about it but like huge pieces of it are about like lots of individual freedom for employees and, and leadership. So like th- that decision to, to send everyone home and then kind of those ensuing next couple of weeks, I think like we were able to make a lot of decisions quickly because it, there wasn't necessarily like a, a million approvals or like, the, oh, yeah. the, the single approval that every idea every every idea has to go go through it was like getting people together making a quick decision and then moving forward and then you know like there's like the idea of like pivoting and being able to to to, to change is also a big piece of, of of netflix so like there's this acceptance of hey my hey maybe this is the wrong decision you know like and it's never and it's sort of like okay well it might be but we may have to give it a shot and then let's assess. And then if it was the wrong decision, we'll learn from it and then either adjust or not do it this way again in the future. So there's this like, there's this like experiment, experimenting, learning kind of philosophy at Netflix. That's, that's just really great and, and exciting and honestly feels like creative decision making. You know, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. you know, it's, you know, I'm like, wa- I'm watching V do these amazing rabbit drawings right now and it's like and it's like you're you're making choices on the fly and you're you're adjusting with them you know like they're not all premeditated you have a general idea of what you're doing but but you're you're kind of making it work and then if it's not work if something isn't working you adjust and and i think that a lot of the corporate philosophy is 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 like that so Mm -hmm. it's been nice to that's great be inside of that place I think I wish, yeah. I I hope that that 
keeps influencing other studios because I think that like that sort of uh, quick pivoting and you know making those quick adjustments is good. And I I mean there's a lot of people at the top. I know that there's a lot of management, but I it does seem like at least in the individual teams there's kind of less people and people are allowed to make decisions and people are allowed to lead a team and it's not constant like checking in. I don't know, maybe you can you can say it differently, but it's you know, the production environment's still a production environment. There's still sure. there's it's not total chaos. But it really does, it, it, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it comes. It does always come from leadership, though, right? Like, and like again, I do hope lots of places can adjust and change. But the 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 key is it's something that Reed Hastings and Ted Sarandos really believe in as our CEOs, right? Like, like who we are culturally as a company is is not just a document that gets that's on the internet for recruitment purposes like it is something that gets discussed and debated and pushed against every day so like it's it's not it's not like a a, like a lip servicey thing but i will say like like we're still we're not there yet in terms of the studio and and what the studio culture is i think we're still defining that we're still figuring that out because you know it is it is slightly different than the corporate side of things and in 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 foundations but there's a lot of things that can that that will that will translate over and hopefully we'll get there mm-hmm. but it's been it's been the hardest job because it's also one i care about a lot and that's good you yeah. know and yeah. it's um it, it's 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 one that demands a lot of my brain so uh yeah but it's good it's exciting <laughs> and i don't know like it's uh i'm working on so on like more things than i've ever worked on at any given time more projects more types of projects i'm like you know i i get to work with our directors on our features as well as our our series side of things i'm i'm helping on preschool projects you know i lean in occasionally and help out on some of the adult projects like you know it's uh it's super yeah. fun but it's like you know i i you're a very busy guy. I'm busy and I'm and I'm like learning constantly. Yeah. I think everyone knows that about you and so it's like <laughs> I was I was honestly I was like we were like let's see if Phil wants to come on the show and then you replied right away and I was like oh shit Phil replied right away. <laughs> I was like that was uh that was surprising cuz I feel like sometimes I'm like Phil must be just too fucking busy right well, now. Well, I'll tell you last I took last week of work off. Oh, okay. And I and I and Amanda and I had been talking about this for a while, but I actually got an Airbnb and I went out to the desert alone without my family. Wow. Because, because this last year has been really hard. It's been really stressful. Like my own anxieties have been tough and, Mm. and it was, it was rough. And I think like I just got in a headspace that was not healthy. And, um, you know, I, I talking to Amanda, talking to my therapist, talking to, you know, coworkers, I really needed a break. So I, I did, I, I took a, I took a break. I was on like, I was in an off the grid Airbnb that had, you know, solar power during the day, you know, wow. no cell signal. And, you know, to talk about like Warhammer, all I did was bring a bunch of miniatures to paint. And, oh, I, and I just, <laughs> I just hold up in this, in this place in the desert and I just painted for, for a week. It was great. And it was so much fun. And, you know, that hobby that I had, as a teenager that I kind of stopped when I got to high school and, and, or sorry, not in high school. Like when I went to college, I stopped Mm -hmm. it. And then, and I didn't pick it up until literally the month before COVID hit. So like about a year ago, I said, I want to get back into this hobby. It was really fun. It's, it's not, has nothing to do with the animation industry. It like, it, it, it checks all my nerdy boxes Mm -hmm. with like, with the with the lore with the gaming side of it with the collecting side of it with the creative side of it so i st- i just got back into it at the end of last year and i actually started like a secret instagram account where i'm posting my models Ooh, um, okay. which maybe i'll mm-hmm. i'll i'll maybe i'll publicly con- connect them uh, that's great soon. i i just love that everyone and i like i got into to gunpla like early on in quarantine because i was just like i always wanted to and the same sort of thing it's like man, I just want to make some fucking robots. Like it was like, <laughs> I used to do it in high school. Same thing. I used to like, I had, I made like seven different Gundam model kits and then you, I just stopped. 
And uh, I wanted to do it right. Like I wanted to learn how to do it right. And so I, I bought a, like a sanding kit and like all this stuff to like make them all look nice. And yeah, to be able to have a hobby that like has nothing to do with anything is is really nice to be able to detach. Honestly, that's like so funny that you mentioned that because there was a moment right before I moved to LA where I started to realize, wait, my whole life is just animation from the moment yeah. I wake up until the moment I go to bed. And I was just like, wait, I have no hobbies. Like what am uh, I doing yeah, with my hard. life? And I literally like, I mean, a couple of things happened in my life, but then like I picked up tarot and that mm. and spirituality as like, I don't know, it's weird to call these things hobbies, but they became hobbies because I became like really interested in them and studying them and reading more about them. And well, that, yeah, that like, was such a welcome change. What do they say? Like, a hobby is something you know? that you like can't make yeah. money off of and something that you only do for yourself that you're not like, right. showing up. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, whatever. It counts. I feel like uh, like that kind of ties a little bit into the question of creative mm -hmm. block, right? Like that whole little sure. escapade or that you were kind of. Yeah, that's actually yourself. that's a very good segue. Let's do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, like sort of I have two different kind of takes on it, right? Like as an artist in, in those moments of creative block, I find I find there's a couple of things, right? One is like as a commercial artist, it's sort of like tough shit. Like you kind of have to power through because yeah. it's That's not work. It's work. It's your job. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't, you can't. But like, I also have a really, I think I have a pretty healthy creative relationship with doing work. That's maybe not my best. Like, I think some people really struggle with like, you know, and I used to say this all the time is like, sometimes when you're hired to do a job, it's it. You're not being asked to do the greatest work of your life. You're being asked to do the job. So like right. sometimes the job calls for you to make creative decisions that you actually don't think are right, but they're right for the project. Right? If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, and this is sort of a fucked up thing to say, but like I'm okay with turning in a shitty drawing if that shitty drawing is works for for yeah. for that given moment or that given well, assignment it's it's a pipeline and so you just you gotta keep it moving you yeah can't spend a week on a background or whatever like you just do it and you move on. it'll be on screen for two seconds most likely so like <laughs> so when i find that i have that creative block i sometimes i can still power through it because i just can sort of go okay i have a mission and i can i can accomplish that mission even if i feel like it's not i'm being stifled for some reason but one of the things that I used to do a lot as an artist was just change the medium, you know? So like back in the old paper days, sometimes it would literally be like holding my pencil differently would unlock more creativity. Like if, you know, I would just draw at the side of my pencil or literally change my grip and that could, that would just change my instincts. And then, you know, you know, again, switching paper types, switching medium types, going from working in a, with from a color race to like a brush pen or a sharpie just to change it up and then similarly digitally i found that i'll change the brush type you know and um and that will that will change stuff not enough people mess with their wacom pressure sensitivity settings that to me is like key is like I, there is a sweet spot for me in terms of pressure sensitivity that mm -hmm. is is the is is what i like best and i think people don't play with that enough and like you know, and you can move that around and all of a sudden it makes it, it makes it feel like you're holding a totally different type of a tool. So I think, you know, to like, I just try to change it up on myself. And then I'm also someone who loves being inspired. So like, I like looking at other people's work. I know some people that don't like doing that because they feel like it depresses them, that they'll never be able to achieve those things. But like, I'm constantly like, like, sh like, I just want to always be seeing things that blow me away and that are amazing. So when I'm really in a rut, I, I, I try to allow other people's creativity wash over me. And I try to go broad, right? It's not just about animation stuff. Like, I love I love art. So I, I try to look at lots of different kinds of stuff to, to get me excited. And then, you know, on the more corporate side of that creative block is it's a little bit harder. And I'm still learning that for myself. But like, you know, I, I needed a break. I just needed to stop. 
and it was helpful. But I got to be honest, like I probably needed a month off. Like a week was good, mm-hmm. but I probably <laughs> I probably need a month. Mm-hmm. And and it's tough. And I don't know. Like this is part of the. This is a. I love not having to sit in traffic, but I also miss having to sit in traffic because. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Because mm-hmm. sitting in traffic was my break because right. I got mm-hmm. to listen to podcasts, got to listen to music, listen to audiobooks, and it was like a slow ramp up or a slow wind down in my mm-hmm. day. Whereas here, it's like I'm cooking breakfast for my kids and then I'm in a meeting immediately. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm at the end of my work day and then I'm, you know, we're having dinner as a family immediately. It's tough. Yeah. There's yeah. no, there's no divide. That part's hard and like, and again, you know, when the weather was a little bit nicer, I would go out to my garage and paint for a couple hours at night. But like, I would find myself getting lost in my painting and then it would be 1 a.m., 2 a.m. and I'd have an 8 o'clock meeting and I'd be like, shit, what did, oh I, just, what did I just do to myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I relate to what you're saying so much because I think like right now I've been like struggling with, like this is the first time I'm like, a, a director on, on the tv show and it's like during quarantine and it's like so easy to feel like i can just spend all of my waking hours like just working on the show and then i'm like oh well wait i want to work for myself a little bit and then i get like really excited to do my personal project and then it's like 1 a.m like you said and then it's like no i can't like you know like i have like people to give assignments to tomorrow <laughs> I think I think in this in wor- this working from home thing is like yeah. you need a schedule. Like I think people, yeah. I, I think if you're just left to your own devices, it's going to be tough. So like, yeah. even last week for me out in the desert, like I built a schedule. Like I stuck to a schedule every single day, and <clears throat> I scheduled when I would be eating lunch, scheduled when I would be eating dinner, I scheduled when I would be painting, and of course I like allowed myself to have some flexibility around it but it was easy it was i could hold myself accountable to doing that and that was really great and i you know and i i painted a ton of stuff and it was super fun i really yeah i relate to that a lot because when i was in japan and i mean for me japan was like mini quarantine to some extent because i was just like i was this guy gene and i didn't really have like i had a couple friends in japan but like i most and i was working freelance all the time so most of my days i was just working from home right but then I build myself a schedule for the morning time where I would wake up every day. And this is something that I wish I could do again, where it's like waking up every day at the exactly same hour and minute. So like I actually got in a really good habit of waking up every day at 7 a.m. sharp. That's amazing. And I had to take out the, sh- the, the trash. And that was like really and that was so great because then I didn't need an alarm anymore like my body would just wake up by itself yeah. and I felt really rested and this is still a schedule thing that I'm chasing after <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah, but then the morning was like all the morning up until like 12 I was just like I was like okay this is just for me obviously I was a board artist so I, I had like a lot of flexibility right I was working on the lad house uh, but like, I was just like going to coffee shop, like drawing for myself, like going to the gym. I had like all these like scheduled tasks. And then when it hit 12 PM, I was like, all right, now it's just working until I go to bed. <laughs> yeah. And that was, that was the best, that was the best time of my life in terms of, um, productivity and my relationship to my work and schedule, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's something about, um, Japan that I like and and just generally like city living and I don't mean LA when I say city living uh is that like you can go outside and just walk to a place to like a cafe and get something and it's like I don't know that's just something I miss I I I like the idea of being surrounded by uh life and you don't have to drive places yeah you you know I I I think like that I mean moving from New York to LA that was a huge culture shock oh yeah Um, yeah. And I think you just find a different version of it. Like, for sure. You know, so I, when, you know, one of the things that I do love is I actually like driving for fun. So, like, if driving only is traffic and frustrating, it's going to be awful. Mm-hmm. But, like, and, you know, and I, you know, moving to LA, you know, I, I, I lived in Los Angeles, like right a couple blocks from kind of Hollywood proper. And I would drive to like El Matador Beach and up the Pacific Coast Highway every weekend because i found that like sitting in traffic to get to burbank every day was a pain in the ass 
but then on a Saturday or Sunday to drive for a couple hours and just drive up along beautiful California coast. Absolutely. Yeah. It was worth it. And then, and then like, you know, you know, we would drive to Vegas or drive to San Diego or drive to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And like, I found that like, Oh, driving is a pain, but I also, it can also do something great that in New York, I pretty much never left, you know, you know, the five boroughs. I barely left Manhattan, Brooklyn, occasionally go to Queens, you know, like it was like, you know, barely, barely went anywhere. So for sure, I think it's, you know, but I do think it's like, it's like, I don't know, changing it up a little bit and finding, changing it up, but also finding that rigor around some type of schedule is really important. And I'm, you know, and I'm, it's tough because I think it's like, it's also sometimes it requires a certain amount of like selfishness. I mean, last week I left my family. What is what? It's like an insanely selfish thing. Of course, you know, I, I, it was something that we had planned and, and, and it was okay with, but like, yeah, you know, you need to do it. Know. And I think that that time driving alone in my car, yeah. I could be selfish, but it was, it was, it was a byproduct of the necessity of commuting to work. Yeah. And I think finding those moments that are truly for yourself, like you said, V, about working for your own stuff, you have to now do it because there's no more separation. You know, mm-hmm. it used to be that the studio was for work and home was for you. And now it's all the same. So you just have to figure out a way to make that separation. So when's Amanda's week off? She wants to do it when it's a little bit warmer. Oh, okay. So she's going to do it. I don't know. I mean, you guys have been together every day with your kids for a year and i i just i think that it's like totally fine to be to want to just be alone for a week and like your kids will be fine yeah i mean every you know it it's fine and like you know i'm an extrovert so like it's been hard to not connect with people i miss i love traveling like i love i love going places i like that you know oh yeah my career has taken me around the world and the fact that I haven't traveled in a year is really sad to me. So like yeah. even just driving out to the desert and, you know, you know, sp- spending most of the time in a cabin was, was not traveling, but just the long drive was really great. And then the, you know, I spent like five hours in Joshua tree national park, just alone mm-hmm. hiking and driving. And it was amazing. So it was like, you know, it was, uh, it was nice. It was, an, it was just a change it up. It felt really yeah, good. Sounds great. Uh, we got a couple of questions that I think were good. Yeah. So from at G Ligamari, Phil, do you doodle often? Do you have any characters you made up that you still think about or doodle today? I doodle all the time. Mostly, it's funny because it's like only if I have paper and a lot mm-hmm. of my work is digital. So I don't, I'm not mm-hmm. doodling as much. I'm flipping through my book right now to see if there's anything I doodle consistently. I, I think not really characters. If I ever doodle a character, I think I draw probably finn or chowder i still really love drawing chowder oh, yeah. um but i don't i don't even see them too much in here i draw kind of draw ugly people <laughs> <laughs> I, I maybe i shouldn't say ugly people but like i like drawing people with like weird fleshy folds with, with character you know mm-hmm. yeah there's no character i would say like if i'm doodling characters it's probably characters from adventure time or chowder sure i like that i don't know if this is a a tidbit you you want to put out there but i like that the drawing i remember one time you mentioned that like the drawing they always use for adventure time promos where they're like running towards the camera yeah. is one that that you did yes and that's the one they're using on hulu i think and i'm like and i'm like man phil must hate seeing that every time it's a really old drawing and it's a and it's that jake is like again it's from the pilot in the pilot Jake would was sometimes on two legs and sometimes on four legs. And in season one, I think he was on four legs maybe once or twice, like only when he'd be really large, uh, yeah. but never like dog sized on four legs. But that drawing is from before boarding had started. Like I was on wow. the show really early and, and we still were thinking that Jake would, would occasionally be on all fours. So the fact that he's sort of running in that yeah. kind of a pose is is funny i i like that drawing though like of i definitely there's drawing. definitely drawings that don't age it's iconic but that drawing's okay and you know the weirdest one for me on that drawing was that like i did it we we had a big we had a big presentation to the network and like that was a drawing that i did as like a piece of key art to just sell what the show was mm-hmm 
to the higher ups. And, you know, I didn't, it wasn't like officially commissioned by consumer products or anybody. I just sort of Mm -hmm. did it. And I guess, I mean, I guess this was one of the like, you know, first time I was in like a lead position, like I was on that show. I, I, I was like shocked to see it everywhere. You know, so it was like, wait, oh, I got to I got to remember now that like some of this work is just going to get out in the world in a big way. Oh, yeah. So Boy, it's a cool it. one, though. It's it, that one's. Yeah, it is wild because I definitely see drawings that I did that I'm like, whoa, that is a weird one to see. It's like 15 years old at this point. Probably yeah. really close to it. Yeah, yeah, it's an old drawing. But, I, you know, I'm really proud of uh, of the stuff on that show. Like, I think it's um, I think w- I learned so much from Penn and then also it really was a great, a great version of me got to show up in that job. So I'm, I'm very proud of that work. Yeah, no, it's all great. And then we had one more question from at that Suber and it's a great one to finish with. I think, uh, how do you see the animation industry changing in the next five to 10 years? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Do, do that. But like short, <laughs> <laughs> answer that giant question i think i think i think you're gonna see i think you're gonna see a lot more filmmakers from all around the world or stories that are that are more global i think the idea that like la tells the stories and for the world is like i think that's been changing for a long time but i think that it's going to just continue to happen i think i think these with streaming has changed so much and not just netflix it's like everybody is like the platforms are global and and they're and they're you know they're asynchronous so so people are finding things at different moments they can be relevant at different moments and i think like you know that variety of types of content for all around the world is a really big one and like you know i don't know so i think like it's also made it way easier for, for everyone to see things from other places. It doesn't feel like you got to hunt and, and search for it as much. Like the fact that, you know, that like people have been watching L- Lupin on, on Netflix, which, you know, we know is a comic then popular manga and anime and now is a live action series, but it's in French and it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's like show always shows up on like the popular list on Netflix on your front page. Like, You know, I think that there's just going to be more and more of that in animation. Um, I think just live action is just quicker to produce and we're seeing that faster. But I think that that we'll see that happening in animation. I also think like, I think aesthetics will change. I think, um, you know, and I I think that you're going to see, I think CG, the tools and technology are getting to the point where people have are are mastering certain things and it's going to unlock more stylization yeah so i'm excited for stylization to show up kind of across all budget ranges so i'm excited for that i mean even like talking about netflix like city of ghosts just came out as we're recording this and like it's almost like a low poly it's amazing yeah it's amazing yeah but it's so interesting because like cg and tv has always been really difficult because of the because of the different budget ranges and i think cg can work in tv in a different way but i think also aesthetic tastes have changed and this and the tools can now do things that maybe they weren't always great at and people have a different appetite for it so i think city of ghosts is absolutely beautiful and Mm -hmm. you know and elizabeth did something really incredible with that show yeah so i'm excited for that and then i'm excited to see like how that influences stuff and honestly like you know when trolls came out from dreamworks like i watched that and i was like wow it's so cool to see a super super high polished feature film that clearly was inspired by some of the work we did on adventure time you know Mm. like it was like you know it it feels like the aesthetics are are being driven and, and 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 things are influencing things and and i and i just get excited for for more and more of that to happen yeah across the board for sure. sure. And I guess five years from now, I think a lot more people may be working remotely. I hope so. I hope that becomes more normalized and, and becomes an option. I know there was a lot of discourse with capital D on, on uh, the internet about it, but I just, I think it just needs to be an option. I think it's going to be an option. I think, I think, I think for some studios, but not for all, but I think, I think that that will be a thing that people look at. And I, th- and I also think that again, like I said earlier, is like, I think it will help 
well, okay, maybe here's what I'm instead of instead of making this a prediction about five years is if you are someone who chooses to work from home and you choose to work from home not in a major city, go teach a class at your local art school or your local college because if you want this to work, you have to also allow people to grow and learn this stuff from you. I think that's the thing, right? Is when you're mm. in a studio, you're learning from everyone around you. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. you're not in a studio, you're not learning. You are learning, but it's it's in a slightly different way. So you have to go and give it back. And I, you know, I taught at CalArts for 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 8 years, and the best part of teaching at CalArts was everything I learned from all of those students. So mm. like it was absolutely like a symbiotic relationship where you know, I was teaching my filmmaking principles or my character design principles, but every day I would come in and someone would someone would teach me something about my own opinions or or share something with me that really that really opened my mind to lots of different stuff. So like I think this work from home thing can happen and and, and I think people can work globally, but I think they're the like concentration of the knowledge base has to continue to to kind of push and pull forward and maybe that's teaching classes online but i do think there's like a real value in in physical in a physical relationship with creativity in proximity to it that like you can only get when you're having a having coffee with somebody or or looking at somebody's sketchbook because it's Mm -hmm. it's not I don't know. When it's digital, it's really easy to make it transactional. Here's the one drawing I want you to see. When I would be in my classroom, my students would show me that one drawing, but then I would also look at their sketchbooks and see more stuff or look on the back of the piece of paper or I could see the versions of it that they didn't want to show me. And it was a it was a select it's just a slightly yeah. different creative relationship. So, yeah. you know, I I do think like people working remotely, but I like encourage everybody like go teach class. Yeah, I think it's good advice. I also think that I, I've been talking to some friends about it, and I I hope that more people just like get studio shared studio spaces as well if they do choose to. Yeah, work from I think home. I think that's exactly I think that's exactly right, Gene. And I think yeah. if people are like leaving the cities, like you you know building these little creative communities, I think that's that sounds mm-hmm. awesome. It sounds yeah. exciting. I mean, like you know, it's. You know, I don't know. That's really cool to think about. And that's yeah. happened in comics, right? Like like comics and illustration, that kind of stuff has already been happening for a long time. And it's sort of yeah. what yeah. the con the con environment does is it creates these inflection points for people to come together as a community. And I wonder if if animation will all of a sudden change. If the inflection point is no longer every day in the studio, if it becomes, oh, every three months everyone meets up at a convention, mm-hmm. it could be really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I miss conventions. I miss that that like checking in with people and like there's definitely a, a hub sort of thing that uh those brought. So lastly, I guess, like what are your personal goals for your career, for just sort of what you want to do, uh, if you have any idea of what that is? It's the I hate this question because I'm like I'm Well sorry, Phil. I know. It's it's a hard one for me to answer. Like yeah. I I still, and this has nothing to do with being an executive or being an artist or whatever, like this is just my own human dilemmas, is like I still just am looking for like that certain level of fulfillment and happiness in that Mm work-life balance. It's really Mm -hmm. difficult for me. It's it's part of that burnout. It's part of that needing to get away for a week. Like so I, I, and maybe I'll never exactly find it, but I hope to get better at it. I hope to get better at finding the right that right fit i want to not be as hard on myself i think i can be really hard on myself and and it doesn't always bring out the best in me sometimes it's you know it can bring out depression and and sometimes stagnation and some of my own you know motivation levels can go down so like i always am looking for like how do i how do i navigate the world where i have more control over it than than sometimes the the outside world has over me i'm someone who is very um affected by how i think others perceive me or 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 feel about me and i also am really bad at taking a compliment so like i only ever really experience the negative which is 
awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I relate to that. And painful. So like that's something I'm working on. Um, therapy has been helpful, but it's, it's going to be a long journey. I don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I guess like, I just, I hope my kids are, I hope I can be a great dad and, and have awesome kids and kind of you support are. them. Well, yeah. Maybe if you stop taking these week long trips away from your kids, know, right? Oh no. Maybe if you stop running away, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know, right? Um, I'm sure they, I know they love you uh, very much. <laughs> All the beautiful family photos you guys are always taking. They're pretty uh, good. They're pretty good. Yeah. No, you got, you got, a, you got an awesome family. And yeah, I lo- I'd love to get Amanda on the show. Amanda has her own crazy, amazing journey. She's and, got a uh, great story and it just gets better and better every week. So I, yeah, well, I don't even know what she's up to. So that'll be, int- that'd be exciting to hear. Yeah. Well, she's currently running DC superhero girls at Warner brothers, but oh, okay. then, uh, okay. she's got some, she's got some uh, coals in the fire that are exciting coming up. So awesome. Great. Well, well thanks for having me on the show guys. Oh, yeah. This was really fun. Of course. That's the end of this creative block. Thanks to Phil for being our guest and sharing his story. And thanks to our listeners. Follow us on Twitter. That's at Creative Blog, Creative Without the Vowels, where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask your guests. Huge thanks to my sister Clemens for editing the podcast. Please subscribe to the channel if you love our content. I've been your host, Gene. And I was V. Keep being creative, and we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 <laughs>